Welcome everyone to this fourth uh, webinar in a workshop sponsored by the Environmental Health Matters Initiative of the National Academy of Sciences. My name is Kathy Kling. I am the chair of the organizing committee and I'm delighted to welcome you to this uh, fourth week in our five week series. The topic is reducing the health impacts of the nitrogen problem. Um, we are focused on um, ways in which we can um, work with agriculture to maintain productivity, as well as to address uh, some of the nutrient problems, nitrogen that um, come from um, our highly productive agricultural system. Um, today, we will be um, talking to having a, a group of panelists, and I will be introducing um, the um, the, the moderator of the panel. Um, but first I want to introduce and thank the rest of the organizing committee. Um, myself, as I said, I'm a professor at Cornell University. The other members are Elena Austin from the University of Washington, Jerry Hatfield from the USDA, Jim Galloway, University of Virginia, Jennifer McPartland from the Environmental Defense Fund, Robin Wilson from Ohio State, who will be today's moderator. So you'll be hearing quite a bit from Robin today and Raj Koslov from Kansas State. In addition to the intellectual contributions and help of this group of people, there have been three key National Academy staff members, Carol Laney, Janelle Walsh Thomas and Sarah Harper, who have done all of the heavy lifting in organizing, logistics, as well as providing lots of intellectual contributions to the effort. Um, the goal of this workshop series is to, um, a couple, three things I'll emphasize. Um, first and probably foremost, at least in my mind, is information exchange. Too often in addressing difficult problems in society, we stovepipe the disciplinary expertise. And without bringing disciplinary expertise together across a wide slate of backgrounds, it's gonna to be tough, if not impossible, to solve some of these problems. So for this workshop, a goal was information exchange, bringing together- my mind is information exchange. Too often in addressing difficult problems. Hi, I'm getting an echo. So I think I'll just keep going and apologies for anyone who's having that. Um, we uh, will be bringing uh, a group together from natural, physical and social scientists. And you'll be seeing some of each of those type of scientists today. Um, the goal is then based on that kind of information exchange to have an informed discussion and really provide a foundation for which people can talk to each other, they can communicate across. And ultimately the goal is to accelerate progress in solving this problem. These are issues and problems that are gonna be around for a while, they're not gonna be quick, but we're hoping by doing this kind of convening activity under the auspices of the academies, we can help to move the needle. Those of you who have been able to be with us in the past uh, four weeks know that this is our fourth. The first of the webinars was a foundational overview of the nitrogen problem, its extent and coverage. And I'm gonna outline a couple of the key takeaways from that session before we kick off the rest of, the, of today. Um, in addition, our second session took a look at the kinds of technologies and incentives to farmers and growers to adopt those technologies at the farm level. Our third session looked at the broader landscape and innovative technologies, as well as a variety of agricultural farm programs that are designed to support the development and implementation of technologies to reduce the loss of nutrients. Today, we're gonna continue with the theme of incentives and uh, we'll be looking at policies again and the potentials for various market solutions uh, and the limitations 
for those market solutions in order to address the problem. And then we hope to have a very engaging panel to discuss what seems doable, what next steps there might be, prospects for moving us forward. Next week, we will dedicate the entire time to reflection and synthesis. Very quickly, before I turn things over to Robin, I wanna kick off um, by a very quick overview of some of the key takeaways from our first foundational webinar. That's available for anyone who hasn't seen it and is interested to watch on the Academy's website. Uh, first, I give a very quick introduction to two key legislative, uh, federal legislation um, policy directives, the Clean Water Act in 1972, which regulates water pollution from industry, but most of agriculture, about 40% of the U.S. land area that is in agriculture, um, is not directly regulated under that uh, act. The Safe Drinking Water Act from 1974 likewise regulates drinking water for its quality uh, from public providers, but there are many people who get their drinking water from private wells, and that act does not require or enforce any kind of um, regulation on the quality of that water. Mary Ward gave us a wonderful overview of the evidence from the epidemiology and public health literature about what we know about risks from particularly nitrate ingestion uh, for human health. Uh, in addition to the long time known blue bear baby syndrome, uh, there is now increasing evidence that there is some risk of colorectal cancer, thyroid disease, and birth de uh, defects, neural tube defects. She noted that future studies of these and other health outcomes should include improved exposure assessment for those that are highly exposed. Craig Cox continued that frame of discussion by looking at what we know about the extent of contamination in drinking water and the amount of exposure. And he noted that there's still quite a bit we don't know about the extent of the problem. Ken Kassman, uh, introduced us to the incredibly important role that nitrogen fertilizer has in our food system. It's not a coincidence that we use a lot of nitrogen. In fact, it is uh, very productivity enhancing for food, fiber, and fuel production um, that comes from agriculture. He called for a national research agenda to better understand how to balance production and environmental quality issues. Matt Helmers introduced us to nitrogen loss um, from large scale row crop agriculture in particular in the United States and noted that it has been heavily exacerbated by the fact that we have um, adopted a very productive system of annual crops using tile drained systems across 50 or 60 million acres. Um, that has fundamentally altered the, the, the hydrology of this landscape and unintentionally has created a situation where it's much harder to retain nitrogen on the land. Finally, Eric Davidson continued the discussion about the leakiness of nitrogen uh, and noted that such leakiness occurs along the continuum of our food system in many, many ways. By learning more about it, we can, of course, hope to control um, and, and create policies and incentives to address the negative components of it. Before I hand this to Robin to moderate the rest of today's webinar, uh, I thought I would leave you with this picture from the Agricultural Census. Um, USDA's um, uh, website has this and lots more information. Uh, the goal here is really just to put in your mind uh, the, the scale of the agricultural footprint and of therefore the nitrogen issue coming from agriculture. The dark green is areas of land where at least 50% of the land area is cultivated. These are heavy agricultural areas. The lighter green are also uh, areas where there is a lot of cultivation. 
roughly 44% of total land area in the United States um, is devoted to agriculture. It's a very important part of our economy. It obviously is very important for all of us. And it has a large footprint with respect to the use of nutrients and nitrates and nitrogen. With that, I'm going to hand things over to Robin, who is going to introduce our speakers and take us through um, the day. Thank you, Robin. Thanks all. Great. Thanks, Kathy. And thanks um, everyone who's participating on the webinar. We're, we're glad that you're here. And thank you to all of our speakers and panelists today. So we're going to start out with a series of four presentations. Um, depending on how quickly our speakers work through what they want to say, we might have some time for questions in between. So feel free to submit questions um, through the Slack discussion. We'll keep an eye on that. Um, and then we're going to transition into a panel with remarks from um, both farmers and, and folks who work on the ground doing conservation, kind of reflecting on what they think um, some of the important steps might be to improve um, uh, nutrient management and agriculture, um, but also kind of responding to some of the comments that, that, that they've heard over the last couple of weeks and that they'll hear today. So that's where we're heading. And we're gonna kick off with our first speaker. It's Dr. Leah Palm Forster. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Applied Economics and Statistics and associate director of the Center for Experimental and Applied Economics at the University of Delaware. She examines farmer decision-making and the design of agro-environmental programs and policies to enhance ecosystem service provision in agricultural landscapes. And she's a fellow with the Center for Behavioral and Experimental Agro-Environmental Research, which is a great, um, resource for folks doing work in the space around behavioral uh, science and farmer decision making. She has a PhD in agricultural food and resource economics from Michigan State. Leah. Great. Thank you, Robin. All right. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to today's session. So today I'll be talking about designing cost effective voluntary programs that help us pay for enhanced agri environmental performance. Next slide. To kickstart uh, this session, I'm gonna provide a brief overview of payments for ecosystem services programs, um, which can be used to compensate farmers for reducing nitrogen losses. Uh, and this overview will help tee up some of the other um, presentations that you'll see in this session. I'm gonna emphasize the importance of directing funds to high impact practices and high impact areas of the landscape in order to improve program outcomes. And I'll discuss how we can use con conservation auctions as a tool to more cost effectively allocate our PES funds. Now, in practice, there are numerous transaction costs, both for farmers and administrators, that can make these conservation auctions less cost effective um, than we would think they may be from a theoretical perspective. So I'll close my talk with a few um, suggestions of ways we might move forward uh, in streamlining these auctions and thinking about other refined targeting approaches that could help us uh, procure ecosystem services at larger scales. Next slide. So the basic premise of payments for ecosystem services programs is that there are individuals who value ecosystem service provision at a level that is higher than the status quo. And these buyers are willing to make payments to providers, and these are the land managers, in order to change management practices uh, to generate some intermediate outcomes, for example, reductions in nitrogen loading, uh, and then uh, providing the final ecosystem services. Payments can be tied to the practice change itself, uh, the intermediate outcomes, or the final services. Uh, typically, we see these PES payments tied either to the practice or the intermediate outcome. Next slide. Now, PES programs can be designed in many different ways, um, but essentially we can understand the structure of the program by answering four key questions. The first question is who pays? Now, last week we heard from Stephen Wallander. He introduced a number of federal programs run by the US Department of Agriculture. Um, and these are examples of programs in which the public is the buyer of ecosystem services. In the next talk, we'll hear from Kurt Stevenson and he'll be talking about water quality trading in which regulated entities are the, considered the buyers. And then after that, we'll be hearing from Kurt Waldman. He'll be talking about supply chain standards. And in this case, private individuals or groups can be the buyers of these services. 
Now, I already mentioned um, what buyers are paying for. They're either paying for changes in practices or changes in final outcomes. This is what we call a pay for performance program. And this can be based on the predicted outcomes, um, which are determined based on modeling exercises or measured outcomes. The next question is who receives payment? Uh, many programs use a first come first serve type of um, enrollment mechanism, but we can also target payments to the lowest cost providers or those with high impact practices or vulnerable lands, which can increase the quality of the services that would be provided. And by considering both cost and quality, we can award payments to the most cost effective providers. And um, that's what I'm going to discuss when I introduce using conservation auctions. Now, as far as payment levels, many of our programs offer uniform or fixed payments. And we are also familiar with cost share programs that might offer to cover a certain percentage of the cost of adopting a best management practice. But there are opportunities to offer offer discriminatory programs through our PES programs, or discriminatory payments rather, through our PES programs, um, in which we would differentiate payments to farmers based on their costs, the practices they're, they're going to adopt, and the environmental benefits that they can provide. Next slide. So reverse auctions can be a valuable conservation tool to allocate this, these PES funds. Reverse auctions are also um, called procurement auctions or conservation auctions. Sometimes they're also referred to as conservation tenders. Um, they're all referring to the same idea. It's a tool that allows us to allocate scarce program dollars, dollars to practices on areas of the landscape that provide the most environmental benefit per dollar spent. These auctions are a useful tool to clear oversubscribed PES programs. They create competition, right, among the um, individuals making offers. So in this case, among farmers or land managers to reduce the costs and increase the quality of offers. And importantly, auctions can help us move from a situation in which we're paying for practices to one in which we're paying for performance or predicted performance. Next slide. So how do conservation auctions work? I should note that there are many ways a conservation auction can be designed. I'm gonna walk you um, quickly through one uh, type of auction, which is commonly used or um, commonly piloted, I should say, for working lands programs. Um, in this situation, a farmer would submit an offer price. This is the amount of money they would require to be paid in order to adopt certain conservation practices on certain areas of land that they manage. Now the offer price and the practices that are submitted in the offer uh, depend on a number of factors, including the farmer's preferences and characteristics of the farm operation and the land that the farmer manages. Practices can be evaluated using biophysical or ecological models in order to predict the environmental benefits that would be achieved if those practices were adopted. The offer ranking and selection process then considers the offer price, the predicted environmental benefits, program priorities and budget constraints in order to select projects. And that selection can be based on a number of metrics, including cost benefit ratios, uh, and also optimization algorithms can be used to select those projects. So importantly, you're selecting based on who can provide the most benefit per dollar spent. So the lower cost of offers and higher quality of offers are going to be more highly ranked. Selected farmers are then paid their offer price and then adopt practices that can provide the environmental benefits. Next slide. There's a lot of theoretical potential for these auctions to really improve the way that we allocate funds in PES programs um, and specifically for working lands. Um, now, these theoretical benefits are achieved by this competition that's created for the scarce conservation funding. We're also able to reveal private information about costs. This information is revealed through the offers that farmers are submitting. And we can target vulnerable lands through the ranking and selection procedure. But on the ground realities create some real challenges um, that limit the cost effectiveness of auctions. 
Uh, importantly, the farmer needs familiarity with the auction process, with the practices that they're going to submit in their offer, and the ability to formulate a bid. And this can take a significant amount of time. Both the agency and the farmer um, face challenges because the auction relies on timely participation in a relatively short window of time so that you can have a number of offers to evaluate together in order to figure out how to allocate your funds in the most cost-effective way. So a short time window can also create a challenge. And the agency needs to have time and resources available to implement the auction and importantly, to evaluate the bids or offers. Um, all of these um, different challenges uh, create transaction costs for the agency and the participant. Next slide. Several years ago, my colleagues and I ran a pilot auction um, in the Western Lake Erie Basin. And what we found was that we had low participation. Right? About 1% of the eligible um, land managers submitted an offer in our auction. And so we conducted a follow-up survey to try to understand why the participation rate was low. Of the people that responded to the survey, about 44% said that they knew about the auction, um, but they were not willing to submit an offer. They listed primary bidding deterrence. These were not mutually exclusive, but about 40% said that they didn't understand the auction process or they found it overly complicated. And I'd also like to note that 28% listed concerns about land rental agreements being an, an impediment to participating in the auction. I'll highlight that we found a linkage as well between these concerns about rental agreements and a perceived ineligibility to participate in the auction because of the um, land rental uh, contracts that these individuals were involved in. Uh, and I highlight this because this has brought up, uh, been brought up several times that land rental could be a challenge um, that we need to think more carefully about in our PES programs. So this, this information highlighted to us that the transaction costs really limited participation. And although we were disappointed at first to have such a low participation rate, um, we actually found that this is a fairly common result in these pilot auctions. Next slide. Several years ago, um, John Roth and his colleagues did a really nice uh, review study uh, in which they were recording the participation rate for pilot auctions um, it, that had been conducted um, in many countries, both developed and developing countries. And what they found was that as the number of eligible participants grew, or in other words, the scale of the auction grew, the participation rate was um, low. So when the number of eligible participants exceeded about 500, participation rates dropped to below 10%. And in developed country settings, participation rates were often closer to 1%. Next slide. Now, um, this is my one um, uh, supply and demand inspired figure that I'll show you so that my colleagues don't take away my economist card. Um, but here I am highlighting the reason why it is so important to have high participation in these auctions. Here I'm showing you supply curves. Um, and so what you see here is on the X axis, you see the um, nitrogen reduction, uh, the total quantity, and this could be measured in different ways, but I've just put pounds on here. Um, and on the Y axis, the unit payment. So the amount mo of money you would need to pay for each pound of nitrogen reduction. So the blue supply curve shows um, what that cost curve would look like if all farms um, submitted a uh, offer. Now the purple supply curve now shows um, what it would look like if only a subset of those farms submitted an offer. The highlighted areas under each curve represent a limited budget for the PES program. And so as you can see, with the same limited budget, we would be able to procure less total nitrogen reduction in the case when we have a smaller number of participants, and we would be paying a higher unit payment for each pound of nitrogen reduced. So this reduces overall cost effectiveness and performance of our auctions. Next slide. So as we think about strategies to improve PES program design, 
I do think there are some opportunities to streamline the design of auctions in order to reduce transaction costs, increase participation, and improve overall performance of this uh, mechanism. Additionally, there may be opportunities well, I should say there certainly are opportunities to um, improve the way that we target uh, where funds are being allocated in order to offer payments to high impact practices on vulnerable lands. Um, this may involve limiting who is eligible for PES funds um, and also may involve encouraging more competition on the quality of the practices um, that are going to be adopted. Next slide. So I'll end on the key takeaway slide again, and I'm happy to take questions um, if we have a few minutes. Thank you. Great, thank you, Leah. Uh, I think we do have time for a question. Um, do we have any hands raised? I can ask one too. A question from Kathy, it looks like in the notes. Hi, sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Um, that was great, Leah. Really, really interesting. Can you um can you talk about the the possibility to scale um, these in, these payment for ecosystem service programs? I mean, one of the things we know is really problematic is the scale at which we have nitrogen and phosphorus problems, and in, in with nitrogen in particular you know, it, there's a lot of acreage where N is, is coming off. It, can you comment about the ability to scale? It, it's a great question. Um, and I have a lot of thoughts kind of racing through my head right now. I guess there's a few things that I think about. Um, one is the importance of considering how to solve a landscape problem by thinking about the whole landscape, right? So the piecemeal um, nature of some of our programs, I think creates a real challenge because we're not stepping back and thinking about what it's going to take to really move the needle at a landscape scale. Now, so that would point to um, programs that are able to have coordination across a larger land area. Now, as I say that though, uh, something that's jumping to mind is a few workshops I've been participating in recently about outreach, which has really emphasized the one-on-one -on -one importance of outreach. So I think what is gonna potentially need to happen is to have programs that can be run at larger scales, um, but to have this local coordination. So to have a, a whole um, team, a collaboration of partners that can be the local contacts and enable to reduce transaction costs for participants and really think about um, you know, how these funds can be allocated. So the allocation would happen on the bigger scale and the one-on-one -on -one outreach to, to engage people would happen on a more local scale. Just a quick follow-up. Um, do, you, do you see any potential for sort of grouped payment for ecosystem service type contracts um, can, you, can you comment on that so that you could, you know, get a critical mass in a certain area in a more coordinated way? Are there, do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I'm smiling because um, that was something that I had hoped to investigate um, with the auction that we conducted several years ago. And we actually um, did allow for group offers. We did not receive any. And the feedback that we got was that there was even additional coordination that was needed among land managers to make this happen. That said, I know that in the past several years, there's been more work investigating this as, a, as an option for our programs. And I know there's a number of laboratory economics experiments who, that have thought about mechanism design um, that could be uh, useful for us to look to. Great. Well, thank you, Leah. I really appreciate that. And I, I think you did an excellent job providing this overview of the challenges we face with voluntary programs. I think people are often very critical of the fact that they're, they're not working to solve our nutrient issues. But I think part of the challenge there is how do we design them to be more effective? And I think you gave a great overview of that. So thank you. Uh, thank we're going to move on to our next speaker. It's Dr. Kurt Stevenson. Uh, he's a professor in the Department of Agricultural and Applied Economics at Virginia Tech. Dr. Stevenson's research interests include incentive-based environmental policy and water resources management planning and policy. He currently serves on a number of governmental advisory committees, including EPA Chesapeake Bay Program Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee 
and National Academies, National Research Council committees, multiple ones. Uh, Dr. Stevenson received his PhD in economics from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And Kurt, take it away. All right, thanks. Um, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me. I'm glad to be here this afternoon. Uh, uh, next slide. Um, um, no, next slide. Oh, so the the um, I was asked to talk about water quality trading and the role water quality trading would might have for uh, addressing agricultural non-point source pollution from nitrogen. Uh, next slide. And so I just wanted to get up front um, summary points. This is what I, this is where I'm going to end up. So this is my starting slide and ending slide. Uh, there's three points that uh, water quality can trading is the way to think about these types of programs, that these are a compliance uh, system for parties that are facing regulatory requirements. And, um, and they're designed as such. Um, and the second point that sometimes people seem to misunder misunderstand uh, is that water quality trading is not a financing mechanism uh, to pay for voluntary uh, ag non-point source reductions for nitrogen. It's not a financing mechanism to get uh, BMPs on the ground to reduce nitrogen. That could be, um, that might be a means to the first end, which is a compliance mechanism. We'll get into that. And the third thing is, as currently being designed in the United States anyway, that water quality trading will, will make at best a minimal contribution, this is my opinion, uh, to reducing uh, ag-based nitrogen loads. So um, I could stop there, but then, you know, <laughs> we'll end up here. I'll, I'll tell you why I think that, uh, in the course of the next few minutes. So next slide. So this is just a simple diagram sort of to lay out what water quality trading is, um, how it's conceived. You got a you got a river system, for instance, that goes into a water body, an estuary, a, a reservoir, whatever. Uh, and you have these sources of nitrogen, these in pipes that are discharging nitrogen into that system. The whole idea of, of a water quality trading program is that um, it is based on an effort to limit the total amount of nitrogen from a group of sources into the system. And so what we would want to do is we want to create this, this, if you think about it, this regulatory fence that limits the total amount of nitrogen from these five sources, for instance, and sets a cap on it. And then next, uh, hit the advance. And then we would allow flexibility to those sources, maximum flexibility to those sources, to figure out how is the most cost effective way uh, uh, to control those in, the, in either by controlling the nitrogen at the source or moving the, the, the rights or the allowances to discharge back and forth among um, uh, was between sources. Now, let's see, whoops. What happened? Whoop. <laughs> Give me one second to reshare your slides. Okay, I'm not okay. I'm not exactly sure. What do I hit to do it to advance the slides? Just. That's okay. I'll keep doing it. Uh, just let me know when to advance. Thanks. I'll just say advance. Okay, but. This is what happens when you let the economist drive. So you'd never want to do that, Sarah. So, um, so ideally next advance. So what we have is a, a, a delineation of responsibilities. The public uh, agency's responsibility is to define what the system uh, can receive in terms of nitrogen loads to, re to achieve our, our, our environmental objectives. And what the private sector is supposed to be responsible for is figuring out the best way to do it, the least cost, the, the least cost, most effective way to get there. Um, so it also allows us to an opportunity to set aggressive goals if we provide the flexibility to do that. Next slide. So that's the idea of trading in concept. Now, so how does agriculture fit into all this? So uh, advance. So we're, there's many more sources than this. These these regulated sources out there contributing nitrogen to the system. So this is my little simple diagram. You've got lots of farms, and then you have even urban areas contributing uh, collectively non-point source loads to the system. Uh, advance. And so the way, the way agriculture fits in is that you then allow 
uh, these regulated sources within this within within the cap to exchange uh, what's called nitrogen credits with agricultural sources and in exchange so what happens in advance is that um, it, uh, yes there you go so you allow that somebody within inside the cap to increase their discharges and while the agricultural source reduces their discharges and um, and the reason why they would do that would be so the point source would could reduce their compliance costs. Next slide. So just to give you an illustration of the rationale about why somebody within a cap would trade with an agricultural non-point source is this is a this is a, a diagram from the World Resources Institute that's uh, several years old now, but it's still effective in um, conveying the point. So you'll see on um, the vertical axis. It's the cost to control nitrogen, cost to reduce nitrogen from the various sources. And on the right hand side is a very a variety of agricultural non-point sources that have uh, calculated very small costs, you know, less than five dollars a pound per year to reduce nitrogen. And on the left hand side, you see uh, point sources uh, and uh, urban non-point sources that have very high costs. So, uh, advanced. So the idea is you'd let those the sources that are ex inexpensive to reduce next advance uh, trade with the folks that are that face regulatory requirements and very expensive costs to move pollution obligations around between them in exchange advance for money. And so the conceptually, at least the regulated sources can save a good deal of money by paying some paying these low cost sources to do some nitrogen control uh, advance. So is it a solution to ag non-point sources? I think there's some just key conceptual issues that people need to understand and some practical experiences. And I'll share a few of those with you now. Advance some conceptual issues. Um, non-point source trades with um, regulated sources are an offset. So it's not a net reduction. It's somebody gets to increase the loads while somebody else gets to decrease the loads. So a trade in and of itself is not a net reduction of nitrogen to the system. And um, the other point is that typically that fenced off part, the regulated part of the total load of nitrogen is small relative to the unregulated source. So you're trying to regulate uh, achievement of water quality goals or environmental goals with a relatively small segment. So uh, next slide, just as an illustration of that last point, these are the simulated nitrogen loads to the Chesapeake Bay from different sources. And in the blue, there is agriculture. In 2019, Chesapeake Bay program estimates that 45% uh, of all nitrogen running in the Chesapeake Bay is from agricultural sources. And that sliver of green there, the wastewater treatment plants are 13%. And, um, and the, the potential trading portion of that is even much smaller. So conceptually, what you're trying to ask somebody to do is, that 13% to pay for the, you know, a portion of that 45%, and it's going to be, um, it's a, it's a tough lift. Uh, in this, and in, in this is the Chesapeake Bay, so um, even the urban lows are a greater percentage of the total than say which you would have in the Midwest. So, uh, it the 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 blue pie square gets much bigger as you move to the Midwest. Uh, next slide. Uh, advance. So. I'll, You'll see in the literature, a lot of people say, well, what about if we just put in trading ratios and we require the point sources to buy twice as much uh, reductions from the non-point source loads in order to, to constitute a, 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 a trade or a retirement ratio? That's been advanced as a way to try to extract extra nitrogen uh, reductions uh, from these regulated sources. Um, uh, advance and you also hear people say, well, all we need is to lower that, lower the cap and, and lower and, and put this um, increased stringency on the regulated sources in order to give them more incentive uh, to, uh, uh, to trade with non-point sources. So these have been sort of, well, how can we sort of uh, reimagine this trading program to get stuff out so we can make some progress on the non-point source loads? Um, you can do those things, um, but they haven't worked uh, well in the past. Next slide. So the practical reality is our experience with water quality trading is that um, 
we have observed that there's very little demand from regulated sources to buy non-point source credits, nitrogen credits from, uh, from, the, from agriculture sources. And there's a, a whole raft of reasons why, that, why that's the case. And it has to do with regulatory uh, requirements, uh, like the regulatory program stresses avoid and minimize type of a logic. Um, the Clean Water Act is about zero discharge. So when you get somebody to reduce, you really don't want to let them back up again to let their loads go back up again. There's a whole um, a whole variety of, of uh, regulatory requirements that restrict the ability of point sources to buy. So there's a whole raft of issues associated um, with the lack of demand for non-point source credit. So there's just very little activity out there with respect to um, buying non-point source credits, in particular for on working lands. The programs that we do see tend to be retirement programs. So you buy agriculture land and you retire it uh, into a tree, into a forest. Uh, there are some programs that have quite a bit of activity in that type of, in that type of realm. But again, that's a one-to-one -one offset. Um, and then there's ag non-point source supply problems. And since the, the transactions cost that Leah was mentioning earlier, that they same transactions are cost in many instances apply to, non to uh, agri agricultural non-point source trades, um, it, which really increases the cost of credits. Uh, farmers concerned about um, risk and tying up land and being in flexibility in, in terms of getting mixed up with a regulatory program, a whole raft of issues there. Uh, advance. So if you look and you look at what's happened, um, and uh, I think there was a reference, if you, people want to read, you know, sort of a, a review of the experience in the United States, there's a, there's a, a reference that uh, we just published a couple years ago, paper we published a couple years ago explains this, but for 25 years of experience since, since the first trading guidelines were issued back in the Clinton administration in 1996, uh, we have very few instances of a program being developed that's created sustained uh, agricultural non-point source with agriculture. So, and even less, very few with any with working lands. So next slide. So if somebody wanted to use water quality trading to, to, to make a dent uh, and to make it uh, in, in addressing the nitrogen issue, you really have to start thinking about um, expanding that regulatory cap. So advance. So for instance, you know, you could put regulatory requirements, mass load limits on uh, non-point source, urban non-point sources like uh, uh, urban stormwater systems, advance, or you can think about trying to regulate a portion of different types of different agriculture and, and trying to, and, say, and then introduce, well, if we put these regulatory limits on there, what kind of flexibility can we provide to make this requirement less costly? Advance. So I'm back to the end. Um, uh, that water quality trading, you got to think about, got to remember, folks, got to remember that water quality trading is a compliance mechanism for those facing requirements to limit nitrogen. And um, it is not a very effective mechanism to try to fund non-point source reductions the way it's currently designed. And um, uh, if you want to make water quality trading uh, uh, play a bigger role, and that's an if, it's an if-then statement. If you want water quality trading to play a bigger role in trying to redress the non-point source uh, end problem, you got to think about in, in bringing more sources under the cap, including part, portions of agriculture. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Kurt. I think we have time for a quick question, so I'm going to actually ask one, and if others have any, we have um, discussion time at the end to circle back to these first set of speakers as well. One of the things that occurred to me while you were talking is, um, I guess, an, another potential challenge for water quality training programs, but how do you do, deal with spatial inequity? So I'm, I'm picturing a community around an industrial point source who is not comfortable with the idea that that local source is allowed to pollute in order to offset that elsewhere. So I just wondered if that gets accounted for in the way we think about um, kind of justice and ethics in water quality trading. Well, it, 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 well, I think this is related to the lack of demand that generally doesn't come up because when, particularly for nitrogen, because, you know, nitrogen is not, historically is not a regulated pollutant under the Clean Water Act. And so when, when, there's, a local, when there's a water quality problem and nitrogen's been identified, the, the first thing folks do is, the first thing the regulatory program does is to 
impose limits on wastewater treatment plants for those nitrogen. So you see right off the bat, like in the Chesapeake Bay program, nitrogen levels from wastewater treatment plants have re been reduced by 60, 65% since 1985, and that's with population growth. So there's, a, and so what you're talking about is a little bit of increase over, you know, a 60 or 65% decrease. Okay. No, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So the urban, the, and, and actually the urban areas or anybody, the large wastewater treatment plant sees an immediate large reduction, mm -hmm. usually when you have these, these programs. Okay. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we will move on to our next speaker. Uh, next, we have Dr. Kurt Waldman. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Geography at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. His research focuses on perceptions, judgment, and decision-making related to agricultural sustainability, environmental change, and food security. And Dr. Waldman holds an MS in Applied Economics from Cornell University and a PhD in Food and Agricultural Policy from the Department of Sustainability at Michigan State. Hand it over to you, Kurt. Thank you, Robin. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to talk about certification and supply chain standards today. I'm going to spend more of my time on on the latter, um, but what supply chain? Well, supply chain standard standards are also uh, often referred to as voluntary uh, sustainability standards, and these are essentially retailer or buyer led um, standards. Next, so the the. Oh, the big picture here is that companies have started responding to perceived reputational environmental risks. They're starting to develop their own sustainability metrics, but there's, there's really significant data challenges that limit their efficacy, and I'll, I'll get into some of the details of that. Um, and this is particularly challenging for, for commodity crops. Sorry, Kurt, so give me one second. Okay, I'll just keep going. So in the, in the 70s, we see the rise of a lot of uh, product certification, so eco labels. And a lot of the, a lot of these are, are these have just proliferated since then. We've, we're, we're seeing about as many as 500 now in the United States. Um, they typically, you know, operate under this logic that we're trying to generate enough demand for the practices that we're certifying that they become the de facto rule. Um, they typically only work under certain conditions and cover a li limited portion of the market. Um, and they, they typically have a, a fairly rigorous um, M&E built monitoring and evalu evaluation built into them. And the, the real logic here is we're just rewarding producers for favorable practices. Next. So the, the next sort of iteration came out of the rise of, of interest groups. So in the 80s and 90s, we started seeing interest groups leveraging corporate risk. So the classic example here is, is Greenpeace sent a fax to Gerber, basically just asking them if they use GMO products in their, in their baby food. They got an almost instant reaction from them immediately immediately change their their practices the a more sustained example is the McCruelty campaign by PETA in which they were able to change uh, animal welfare standards down uh, McDonald's supply chain more recently we've started to see sustainability sustainability scorecards so this is an example from uh, beyond the brands by Oxfam so they essentially take publicly available data on these firms come up with rankings of them and then ask the firms if they're willing to essentially contribute to make these more, more accurate. The logic here is that large retailers control enough of the market share that they can dictate the ter terms to the suppliers. This turns out to be not exactly true and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that next. So the, the, what we see now is a much more collaborative version of this. So these multi-stakeholder initiatives tend to involve industry, NGOs, farmers, academics. So coming together to agree on how to define sustainability. Um, these, are, these are fairly new instruments or mechanisms. So we don't have a lot of research on it. The research, the empirical research that's out there is, is somewhat mixed. You know, there can be high transaction costs or and accountability issues, but in general, what we're seeing is there, there's the potential to have a transformative effect um, from some of these mechanisms. Next. So 
So the, how, how do they work? They, they generally seem to revolve around key performance indicators. So initially firms were really getting interested in life cycle analysis. So sort of calculating cradle to grave emissions um, output for emissions estimates for anything from sort of bread to laundry detergent. Um, <clears throat> they realized that that was very difficult. And so they, they sort of backed off a bit and started just, just coming up with these performance indicators, which are, they're more like metrics than, than the standards that we would see with, with certification. You don't necessarily need to meet some bar to, to participate in this program, to sell to this retailer, et cetera. The basic features of these are their, their voluntary guidelines. They involve data collection from the producers and then data sharing. So this aids in community in companies being able to communicate um, about sustainability to their, their consumers. They generally involve minimal incentives. So it's not like other, um, it's not like the, the certifications where you tend to have an actual premium um, based on your, your product. What, what, what often happens here is you're, you're maybe, maybe subsidized or, or paid a small participation fee to fill out the forms to enroll for a year or two, but there, there generally aren't incentives with these. Next. All right, so this is a, this is a sort of look in the, the, the complex supply chain of, of something like a, a, a corn or a soybean crop. What, what retailers are really trying to do here is to communicate down the supply chain. So to, com to, to actually communicate directly with those producers it's, it's difficult because of the processing and distribution and the way that, that crops like corn and soy move through the supply chains. And so <clears throat> what we see is, is that the ag retailers actually have closer relationships with the producers in terms of, of data. They tend to already have some data sharing agreements where they you know, might make recommendations for seed or fertilizer, et cetera. So you know, one of the real, the real values here to retailers as a you know they can get to know more about their producers through these through these MSIs and these these supply chain standards. Next. All right, so why why are these relevant for reducing nitrogen? So the 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 first part here is that that retailers have really started to experience supply chain risk. So we see them not just responding to reputational risk as, as we did previously, but, but really starting to think about you know, what, what the impacts of climate change are going to be on their, on their supplies in terms of price volatility and an and ability to actually um, keep the supply chains, chains moving. The, the second point is that the, these are relevant in a way that, that consumer eco labels and some of the other um, you know, mechanisms that have focused on product premiums, identifying, you know, direct consumption channels and finding consumers who are willing to pay more for that. Um, you know, consumer eco labels just, just aren't relevant and some of the similar uh, mechanisms, mechanisms just aren't, aren't very promising in this area. And so it just shines a little bit more light on the supply chain standards. The, the other point I wanted to mention is that traceability is getting a lot better. So with the, with the introduction of blockchains um, into, into food systems, we, it's, it's a lot smoother, it's a lot easier to, to track uh, commodities through the supply chain now. Um, this is not widespread, this is, but, this, but this is going to be coming, uh, becoming more common, I, I believe. There's also online platforms like Mercaris who trades in identity products, so you can you can um, essentially find a buyer who's all, who's selling you know non-GMO corn or or um, you know certified organic corn, etc. So the the technology is changing here. Next, all right. So what? How do they actually measure sustainability? So I've just taken a couple of, of examples from from a myriad of tools that are out there, but but you know really what these tools are doing is allowing farmers to enter um, various farm characteristics, management practices, et cetera, and get you know essentially get very 
um, straightforward information about, about environmental outcomes. This often does include a water quality index. Um, it you know, includes a bunch of, of other outcomes as well. And, and farmers are really able to kind of play with these tools to look at different scenarios, to um, guess, you know, to sort of get a sense of, of what's possible. Um, the, the real value to farmers and, I, and, and one of the most interesting parts to me is that there's a lot of learning that can go on here. They're able to compare with um, you know, other farmers in their area, see what kind of practices they're doing. And then firms are able to share this data as well. So they're able to use this to communicate about their supply chain and, and how they compare with industry averages, et cetera. The, the, the big limitations with some of the tools really are just getting the data. Um, it's, it's really hard. It, it's, it's very onerous to fill in the data, particularly for the first time. Uh, a lot of farmers aren't, aren't willing to share it. And so the, you, you see a lot of efforts made to, to kind of get the data flowing off farms as, as they say. Um, one, uh, <clears throat> one other limitation of that is that it's often partial farm data. So um, some of the, the way some of the tools work is you, you might just enter data for a couple of your fields and then it will extrapolate those results to the, the rest of your, of your farm when it's looking at these environmental outcomes. It also is just often making assumptions that are just generalized to practices. And so if you switch from conventional to no-till, um, it, it, it might just give you a, a, you know, it will give you just sort of an average figure of what that uh, change looked like rather than based on, on actual observational data. Next. Okay, so hurdles for supply chain standards, as I'm mentioning, it's the, it, you know, a lot of it's this, this data quality and, and farm diversity uh, concern. This is really similar to what Leah was, was talking about a bit, but, you know, we see that a lot of the, the highest impact is coming from um, certain, uh, certain practices, certain operations, um, certain farms, certain fields, et cetera. But, but a lot of the tools are sort of capturing some of the averages. And so, you know, to some extent we need to, to, to really kind of focus them down. Um, related to this is selection bias. So because these are, these are often voluntary programs, we generally don't know who's participating. Theoretically, you would expect the, the, the producers who are able to participate at the lowest cost to be the ones that are adopting um, quicker, who are engaging with these tools, but we don't really know much about that um, at, at this point. Incentives, so there's, there's really no carrot or stick here. Um, this, is, this, is a, you know, this is a lot of work for both farmers and the retailers, and they've, they've really sort of um, engaged in, in like temporary incentives and ways to draw farmers in, but there's no, no sort of established um, uh, incentive mechanism. And then verification and feedback. So a lot of farmers are really, really interested to see what they can learn from these tools um, because they're not explicitly connected to their, their farm. They don't know, for example, if their, their switch in, in cropping system actually, or in tillage actually, you know, decrease nitrogen in their tile drains, for example. You'd really have to sort of pair this with, with a more uh, field field and farm specific data collection. Next. All right, and, and just to sort of reiterate the, the highlights, you know, this, this is just an area where there's a lot of interest. These are, the supply chain standards are, are growing very rapidly um, and, and groups are working together. You know, far, far, firms are working with nonprofits and academics to create these sustainability metrics. Um, but there's still a, a lot of ways we can improve the data collection around them. Um, and then this is particularly challenging for, for um, you know, crops like soy, soybeans and corn, where we don't necessarily see these direct link to c consumers. We don't necessarily, um, it's, it's more complex sub supply chains, et, et cetera. All right, thank you. Great, thank you, Kurt. Uh, I think we have time for one quick question. It looks like Kathy has a question. We might squeeze in a second too, we'll see. Oh, maybe we lost Kathy. I'm gonna jump to Steve Wallander. I see that Steve has a question. Great, um, yeah, so 
Kurt, I was wondering about um, on the incentive side, whether some of the producers have greater um, certainty about having a buyer located. I know that that's been talked about some as a benefit with um, some of the coffee and other products in South America where, you know, they're not getting a price premium, but they know they have a buyer for however much they can produce given the way they're producing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, in a lot of ways, I, I think when you're talking about it, these these international supply chains, it it you know it's much more focused on you know who the buyer is. With the with a lot of these domestic programs, we see you know Coke, for example, might go into an area of um, you know Indiana or Michigan where they know they have a lot of growers, set up a program there. Um, you know, get get incentives out to, to farmers to participate in this and start, um, you know, getting data flowing to them in that way. Great. Well, thank you, Kurt. I think we will go ahead and we'll try to stick on time here and transition into our uh, last kind of set of speakers in this first part of the session. Uh, so we have a bit, bit of a tag team from the Nature Conservancy, Lee Fixon and Ben Wickerham. Leaf is the North America Soil and Nutrient Strategy Man Manager for TNC. He leads their farmer advisor strategy for working with public and private organizations and businesses who service and advise farmers with the end goal of scaling adoption of soil health practices for our nutrient stewardship and edge of field practices that reduce ag's impact on our water and posi position agriculture as a natural climate solution. And Ben is TNC's Saginaw Bay Project Manager uh, he's worked for 13 years to deliver innovative conservation programs throughout the state of Michigan in a variety of roles with other organizations as well. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in zoology from Michigan State. And as a conservation pra practitioner, his primary research interests involve farmer behavior and motivations, practice permanence, and using agribusiness as conservation entrepreneurs. So I'll hand it off to the two of you. Oh, Leaf, I think you're on mute. I think I'd have this figured out. Um, with the intro, uh, I'm going to kick us off with kind of like a, a little bit of a high level overview of, of our of our some of our over like overarching strategies as it relates to uh, driving the value of manure, and then Ben's going to take a, a little bit deeper dive and and, and stand up uh, an example uh, a partnership and, and project that we're, we're touching down there in, in Michigan in the end. So, uh, next slide, please. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with TNC, we're a global uh, nonprofit. Uh, got our start kind of in land conservation as, as a land trust. Uh, but over the last uh, really 15 years, we've, we've, we've built out uh, an, an ag program, ultimately uh, driving towards two main goals. How can we reduce uh, uh, impact of ag on our, on our, on our water? and our land and and also how can we use agriculture as a we call it a natural climate solution but ultimately uh, transition ag from being a, a, a greenhouse gas emitter to potentially a, a, a mitigation tool so next slide please and and as many of you know you know uh, integrated systems offer a lot of opportunity uh, towards towards both of these goals uh, uh, you know the way our ag program is is touching down is it's really focusing on kind of nutrient stewardship. So how can we increase the, the ultimately the nutrient use efficiency rating of our ag system, as well as how do we get more soil health practices on the landscape? And, and livestock offer some some opportunity to achieve both of those goals. Straight up, uh, livestock allow us to to their nutrient cycling. They allow us to utilize uh, products. They they offer opportunity in diversifying the nutrients going into uh, a four hour nutrient stewardship uh, management plan, you know, i.e. I'm talking about, you know, kind of organic sources of, of nutrients, slow release type sources of nutrients. There's some benefits to soil health, like directly towards soil health, and economic benefits to the farm, i.e. Um, you know, as we're seeing uh, a greater need for edge of field acres and more acres in perennial uh, cropping systems, Livestock allow us to continue to make uh, 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 an agricultural commodity off of those acres. Uh, and, and that goes the same for, for edge of field uh, type acres. So we can, we can graze and hay those, those, those grassed acres along rivers and, and lakes and, and grass waterways. Next slide. Uh, 
Uh, but we need to be careful, right? So uh, we don't want to uh, we, we don't want to get caught off guard by the back end of of that strategy, both figuratively and literally, right? Uh, we're seeing huge growth in in the uh, animal livestock industry, and that growth is anticipated to continue to grow, especially as developing countries get a taste for uh, meats and cheeses. Uh, next slide, please. And and that. It, that risk, you know, this is this is about water quality, right? So that that risk shows up in in nutrient balances. Uh, more and more, we're seeing uh, critters migrate to the Midwest uh, for a number of different reasons. But we need to be working to make sure that as more livestock move to the Midwest and we see more infrastructure being developed there uh, through through uh, uh, you know meat processing facilities and stuff like that, that we're we're making sure that those animals are being accounted for in, in nutrient management plans. And, and Wisconsin's Discovery Farm Program, they did a, a, a nutrient use efficiency uh, study here uh, two years ago. And it, you know, pretty consistently, a lot of their worst you know, ranking fields had either basically they were coming out of a legume or they had a manure component to the natural, the nutrient management system. Next slide. So what can we do? And, and, and so, we here at TNC, we think one of the simplest ways to do this is really work uh, to develop strategies that that show manure not as a waste product, but as a, a, a valuable byproduct. So next slide, please. But to do that, we have to overcome uh, a number of different challenges and barriers. One is just straight up kind of traditionally, it's been talked about as a waste product. And, 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 and in fact, for those of you who might be working for NRCS on this call, Please change a couple of your practice standards. You know, it, 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 when NRCS refers to, uh, you know, where you store your manure as waste storage, like it, it, it has that, that, that connotation that like, I just need to get rid of this as simply and as cheaply as possible, right? It's not a waste. This is a byproduct that, that has a lot of value for, for you and your neighbors. Um, there are some agronomic challenges, right? So your, your, your timing windows for getting it on are, 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 extremely tight and not necessarily when you have an active growing plant. Uh, the, the, the nutrient ratios are, are usually fixed. Um, and then there's variability in those ratios as, as you may be applying that manure across the field. Um, and, and it's tough to integrate into precision ag programs. Um, there's also economic challenges, you know, tied to the cost of storage, cost of transportation with trends towards uh, more and more CAFOs, how do we economically get that manure back out across the, the right number of acres? Uh, and the technologies that allow for that are often expensive and require additional, um, you know, expensive inputs into the future. Uh, and, and going back to that perceived, you know, value, right? Like, you know, the person taking it is, is saying, hey, you got to get rid of it. Why don't you pay me? And the person with the manure is like, hey, this is a valuable resource. Um, we're seeing less of that. But anyway, so next slide. So we at TNC, so we're all about, you know, like conservation at a pace and scale that matters. So how can we accelerate solutions that help us address some of these barriers? Uh, one of the biggest ones I'm most excited about is uh, some of the new technology that's coming out at, that helps us uh, um, like create as applied of the manure. Uh, and so like John Deere has their, their well, it, it started as their harvest lab, but they're calling it their manure constituent sensor and basically it can measure mpk uh values of manure as it's leaving the applicator in the field and and that farmer can then uh do a variable rate application to one of those but then create as applied for the others which then can be integrated better into your four hour nutrient stewardship plan um and and you can better balance and get that manure over the right number of acres so the way we're trying to accelerate the uh, behavior change here is by offering cost share for, for farmers. This is in Minnesota. We're offering cost share uh, to uh, custom applicators and custom pumpers to put this technology on, on their equipment. Next slide, please. Uh, the other area that, that, that I'm really excited about is nutrient recovery technology. Um, this can be everything from helping you uh, balance that nitrogen to phosphorus ratio of the manure to uh, dewatering, so helping with the cost of, of exporting nutrients. Um, it can help with what I was just talking about, integrating into precision uh, uh, nutrient management plans um, and, and creating really accurate as applied. Uh, it can help turn that manure into a, a, a product that can be used back on the farm, whether it's bedding, 
Um, it can help with uh, water cycling, right? So if you're in a drier area, you know, like there's technology out there that can get that, wa that manure to a, a standard that can be fed back to the cows. Um, you know, it can help reduce the cost of storage because of that dewatering component. Uh, and, and ultimately it, it can create a value added, you know, byproduct. And, and a lot of this is going to be driven by your specific end game and what your challenges that you may need to be overcoming. And, and kind of the way that TNC is, is thinking about and plugging into this equation, like how can we accelerate this is ultimately de-risking some of these new, new technologies and helping pilot some of them. In Washington State, uh, TNC and a bunch of their partners out there went to the state government and, and advocated for a, a, a pretty good sized pot of money to, to pilot some of these different technologies on, on dairy farms in, you know, across the state to, to, to you know, hopefully de-risk the, the, that adoption. Uh, next slide, please. And with that, you know, I talked about that, you know, the, the whole renewable fertilizers kind of world, whether it's Struvite or looking at like, so Cedron Technologies, you know, they, their system creates a 15% nitrogen certified organic um, uh, uh, aquas ammonia. So like, I, I don't know of too many nitrogen sources out on the market that are that are certified organic and that, that high at percent N, but, you know, creating... How can we recover some of that additional cost and recovery technologies through the potential value-added products that you're going to be producing um, um, from that, you know, using that manure as your base, you know, your base input. So next slide, please. Uh, and, and then the, the, the last section I'll kind of talk about before I hand it over to, to Ben, and this is kind of our segue slide, um, is, you know, when done right, like manure can be one of these natural climate solutions. It does improve soil health. And, and so here in Minnesota, I, I live in Twin Cities. It, you know, we're standing up an ESMC pilot, Ecosystem Service Market Consortium pilot, that, that really is going to, um, uh, one of the goals, I should say, is, is to look at what the potential amplifying effect of having manure integrated into, into acres that are enrolled in ESMC can have on, like, can the farmer actually see an increase and in, in potentially for lack of a better words, you know, credits being generated off those acres. So with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Ben, who's going to take a deeper dive into uh, one of the specific pilots that kind of ties all this together. Thanks, Leif. So in the time remaining, uh, yes, I'm going to share an example of how we're working here at the Michigan chapter in the Nature Conservancy to really uh, try to institutionalize uh, some of these farmer sustainability programs uh, to achieve nutrient reduction outcomes. And it's really, uh, the bottom line is working with supply chain partners. Uh, so, so for us, it really represents the, the uh, fundamental shift in the way that conservation is incentivized. And it's really the culmination of a better part of a decade of work here in Michigan by TNC to innovate and, and try to optimize the way traditional cost share um, has been delivered uh, as a way to achieve greater environmental return on investment. Uh, this is based on a, um, a history of work I'll, I'll go over here in a minute and also um, a lot of time spent on social evaluation to really uh, explore the research topic of who's the best conservation intermediary. Is, is it really uh, NGOs like, like the Nature Conservancy? Is it the local uh, soil and water conservation district? Or is it the, the most trusted advisor of all, uh, the agribusiness partners working with the farmers? Next slide, please. So here's a bit of a, a history of, of our work, uh, like once more. Uh, and I'll take us back to uh, 2015 when we first started to um, really get in and try to disrupt and innovate how cost share was delivered to try to institutionalize um, a more sustainable way to do it. But we started with our CPP program, which is great. It allowed us to and co-lead an initiative with our Michigan Agribusiness Association um, the downfall, at the end of the day, it was still an NRCS program and rather rigid. Next slide. So from there, uh, we, we took the next step to innovate further and de uh, started delivering a pay for performance program that really should be uh, more accurately titled as pay for outcomes. Um, this got us closer to our goal. Uh, there was added flexibility. Uh, it really put us closer to the supply chain because we didn't have to work uh, in the constraints of a USDA office, uh, we could work with those farmer advisors to identify farmers uh, eligible for the program. And at the end of the day, uh, it provided a higher environmental return on investment. Next slide, or excuse me. 
one more. Uh, and then that brings us here to today. Uh, this kind of represents a good, better, best scenario. Uh, this year, we're launching a couple uh, pretty exciting initiatives that are really grounded in the supply chain itself. Uh, this shifts farmer incentives away from um, traditional agent, public agencies or even third party entities like TNC and, and puts it within the supply chain itself to really de deliver farmer incentives at the point of sale itself. Um, it provides uh, really a risk-free opportunity for uh, supply chain partners to, to demonstrate how this might work, a sustainability program and, and kind of test the market. And uh, at the end of the day, it just creates a more holistic systems approach to delivering conservation on the farm. Next slide. So to, to be able to do this and launch a program like this, you need a willing supply chain partner. And uh, as I'm sure many on the call here today, we've, we've seen a groundswell in these types of um, interest from the industry, right? Um, what I'm gonna share today is actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hone in on a partnership where we're working and culminating with the dairy industry of all, um, of all entities. Uh, it, it's really a good example of what Dr. Waldman just explained as a, as a multi-stakeholder collaboration rather than a certification program. Um, and it really provides us a direct link to the consumers. Uh, and consumers are a big part of the why, but you know, environmental solutions uh, have to come with an economic condition to make them possible on a continual basis. And that's, that's really the, um, the, the background of what led to this net zero initiative by the U.S. dairy industry. And, and you may or may not be familiar with this. Um, a pretty aggressive goal, but um, dairy has been a great partner to work with and really being proactive in, in pioneering some of these initiatives. You got to remember a lot of the um, advances and reforms in animal welfare came from the dairy industry. Um, so they're a great partner to work with and you need that, um, that overriding goal to, to really drive all of this to work. Click once more. So where TNC can come in is really this last bubble um, in terms of improving optimization of, of manure and nutrients. Next slide. So what, is, what will the program actually look like partnering with the US dairy industry to, to get them closer to this net zero initiative? Well, we've, uh, we've proposed a, a project that would ultimately reduce greenhouse gases and improve soil health uh, by implementing both manure management practices, in-field uh, soil conservation practices, and also um, feed improvement practices as well. Um, we're, now I, I'm kind of speaking in, in, in vague terms. The, the project is uh, soon to launch here in, in uh, 2021, but I'm reluctant to um, provide too many specifics on the uh, particular partners involved in the uh, net zero initiative. Um, but we do have, have some partners on board that are willing to provide the incentives for us to go through and work through their, the dairy feed supply chain to achieve these outcomes. So it's gonna launch in, in Michigan and in Wisconsin. And how it works is with investment from these uh, dairy, dairy partners, we're gonna work through local cooperatives, dairy co-ops and, and milk processing plants to really work through their network of, of producers to identify farmers that would be eligible for uh, this program to make improvements and achieve these, uh, these environmental outcomes. So below kind of shows the work stream of, of how this would go. Um, our partners are in the process now of launching recruitment. Um, there's gonna be a, a self-assessment period to really determine where the areas of greatest need are uh, for participating farmers. Um, and then from there, it's a data collection. It's, it's uh, implementing practices to make those changes and achieve those desired outcomes that uh, partners in the Net Zero Initiative are, are after. And then hopefully create a really positive feedback loop. Next slide. And I know we're short on time here, so I'll probably just gloss through this. Um, these are just kind of the, some of the objectives on how we, we're planning to deliver this. Uh, it really is meant to provide a comprehensive conservation consulting service to, to dairy farmers. Um, it's not a one size fits all. It, it's a suite of practices and it's really meeting the farmer where they are based on their baseline assessment and delivering conservation practices that are gonna allow them to achieve those environmental services uh, and, and add those. So it's a multi-tiered approach. It'll be everything from no-till to cover crops in field. Um, to, to again, manure management. There's a lack of uh, manure injection uh, 
in, in, in the particular region that we'll be working and also manure application risk management as well. We, we lack a lot of regulation in Michigan that, that some other Great Lakes states have. So a lot of room for improvement to achieve uh, GHG outcomes with manure management. Next slide. Oop, one, one more, Sarah. Okay, um, so again, I apologize for the vagaries. Um, we haven't quite inked the, the official <laughs> um, agreements with our uh, supply chain partners yet. So I'm reluctant to put the liability out there of, of stating explicit goals, but I did wanna share this with you um, just, to, just to give you an idea of the things that we'll be tracking that, um, that really the supply chain partners have shown interest in that, that are gonna track towards their sustainability goals um, and the net zero initiative. So by implementing these practices, um, we'll be tracking all of uh, all of the above by 2023. And, and at that point, uh, it'll really come to a tipping point where hopefully we've demonstrated a, a sustainable closed loop system that will attract other dairy cooperatives um, to follow similar models. So uh, by 2030, we really hope to scale this up to, to um, multiple co-ops and processors around the Great Lakes. And I will end there. I think we're at or maybe over time. So I yeah. will end there and um, our email information is there. If anybody has information that would like to follow up with any of the initiatives uh, Leif or I work on. Excellent. Thank you, Leif and Ben. And we will be bringing these first um, sets of speakers back at the end for our kind of general discussion with not only all five of these individuals, but also our panelists who are upcoming. So if you have questions, there'll be an opportunity there as well. Um, so before we transition into our panel, who will be kind of reflecting on their personal experiences um, and perspectives in the space and also reacting a bit to what they've heard today, I wanted to share with you, if you've been participating in this series of workshops, you've had an opportunity to provide some feedback on what you think some of the challenges and um, perhaps opportunities are moving forward in this space. So they're gonna be pulling up a slide here with some of the feedback from that, that survey on uh, new policy and market opportunities. I'll wait for Sarah to pull it up. There it is. So this is just some of the feedback. There was a lot of really specific comments. So we just went through and tried to pull out some of the themes that we saw, but this is what's been coming from participants in, in the workshop series. Um, so markets for conservation measures, so we've heard about that today, payment for ecosystem services, maybe, maybe expanding those types of programs, maybe paying for those actual measured outcomes versus just practices or predicted outcomes like Leah talked about, um, markets for alternative crops, small grains in the rotation, so diversifying, which is something I noticed with our, some of our farmer panelists today, they're operating a very diverse farms, which I think is a good thing for conservation. Um, integrated nutrient and carbon markets, uh, regulatory mechanisms to more effectively deal with the release of N from fertilizer and crop N fixation sources, um, perhaps differential regulation of potential input sources between states. Um, another idea that was a little different from a lot of the other things we saw was policies that preserve farmland so that decisions aren't driven by land payment demands. Um, and then we've heard some conversation about removing or revising uh, the current subsidy system um, within U.S. agriculture, uh, that there might be better ways to do that. There are countries where that doesn't even happen at all. Um, and then increased leadership from ag suppliers, commodity organizations, and then some examples we've heard again today of farmer-led watershed collaboration. So seeing more of that perhaps um, bottom-up and um, kind of business-driven um, solutions. So just some of the ideas we wanted to share that we're hearing from folks, and I think, again, are, are reflecting some of the discussions we've had so far. Um, so at this point, we will then just transition into our panel. Um, so we had a bit of a shift in plans today. So we have one panel with representatives from um, the farming community across the U.S., in fact, kind of widely spread across the U.S., um, and also a representative from the Environmental Defense Fund, um, who's also involved in kind of on-the-ground action. Um, and so what I'm going to do, I think, is just is just um, introduce all four of our panelists and then kind of hand off to them separately. They're, they've been each asked to prepare about 10 minutes of remarks, uh, both bringing their own perspective and, again, responding to what they've heard. Um, and so let me do quick introductions and then we will kick that off. Um, so our first um, panelist today is Rod Weimer. Uh, Rod's a farmer and farm manager for Fagerberg Farms in Eaton, Colorado. He's been researching ways to farm more with less and believes in accomplishing this goal with drip irrigation. 
Uh, Fagerberg Farms is one of the largest shipper growers of onions in the U.S. and has won Conservationist of the Year Awards and Steward of the Land Awards. In 2015, Mr. Weimer was chosen National Farmer of the Year for his efforts in precision agriculture. Uh, then we're going to hear from Rochelle Kruzmark. Her husband, Brad, and their son, AJ, grow soybeans, corn, forage, grasses, and cover crops, custom finished swine, and own a cow-calf beef herd on their family farm near Trimont, Minnesota. Her son, Caleb, direct markets production uh, through Farmers Premier Meats. And the Kruzmark family uses precision technology, no-till, strip-till, and cover crops to improve soil health and cohabitate with wildlife while serving as environmental stewards. Uh, then we will hear from Richard Wilkins. Richard is a farmer of, of another very diverse operation, similar to Rochelle's, uh, from Greenwood, Delaware. He's president of the Delaware Farm Bureau and past chairman of the American Soybean Association. He's been involved in helping to craft national agriculture policy during development of past as well as the current farm bill. He represents farmers as a director of the Supporters of Agricultural Research Foundation Board and the National Coalition for Food and Agricultural Research. He has traveled internationally on numerous trade missions seeking to open and expand global access for U.S. ag products, as well as developing diplomatic relationships with leaders in foreign markets. And then our final panelist will be Jenny Aylin. Uh, Jenny directs the Environmental Defense Fund's work to improve the sustainability of consumer goods through partnerships with the private sector. Her primary areas of expertise include the sustainability of food and agricultural supply chains, as well as mitigating greenhouse gas impacts. Prior to joining EDF in 2011, she worked for the Arkansas Economic Development Commission, focusing on renewable energy policy and for ABT Associates as an analyst estimating the costs and benefits of environmental regulations. She has an MA in energy and environmental analysis and a BA in environmental analysis and policy from Boston University. So thank you to our panelists for your reflections and I will go ahead and hand it off to Rod. Thank you, Robin. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, we've been working in ways to make us more efficient and being better stewards of the land. Um, I traveled the United States searching for ways to, to make us better at what we're doing. And um, in our practice, we found that drip irrigation is probably the best, um, not only for saving water, but using less uh, input costs. Um, we installed our first system in 1998, so we've got our feet on the ground pretty good. And, uh, every year it's exciting. We learn more and more. Um, it's kind of made farming fun again. But um, <clears throat> through our drip irrigation, we do all of our injection of, of our fertilizers and um, we are eight inches deep with our tape. So therefore our, our, uh, our crop is above it and the root system is right by our tape. So we were able to cut our fertility by 30 to 40 percent less nitrogen with drip irrigation because we're spoon feeding it when the plant needs it and not blasting several pounds of nitrogen on it and watching it run away from us. Um, like I say, we did cut out between 30 and 40 percent less and we're maintaining a higher quality crop, a higher yield, and the shelf life of our crop is better with this. Um, and we owe it all to the technology that they're putting out with drip irrigation. Um, we are fully automated. I watch my inputs. Uh, I can turn fertilizer on, off, um, anywhere in the United States or anywhere in the world actually with my, my smartphone. Um, everything is monitored. We have uh, data, it keeps all of our data, all of our records online. Um, our, our biggest issue is food safety. Um, onions being our primary crop, we have to really watch what we put through our system um, to make sure it's safe. And, and I feel that uh, there's no safer crop or or food supply that's any safer than what we grow here. Um, it's taken several years to figure this out. Um, matter of fact, I've had the opportunity to work with Raj Koslaw um, when he was with CSU. Um, it's just it's just been really fun learning and, and learning how to make us better and, and 
like say actually grow more with less. Um, we're using 30% less water. In Colorado here, our water uh, supply is probably one of our biggest issues. Um, we depend on snowpack from the mountains, from the Rocky Mountains, and, and this year it's uh, pretty slim up there. So um, with drip irrigation, uh, it's a way of survival for us. And uh, management is really tough, but it, uh, it really works. And I could go on and on and on. I love talking about what we do here, but I know we're running short of time. And, and uh, I, I just want you guys to know that there are places out here where um, they teach um, and try to help us farmers become better at what we do. Uh, with drip irrigation, your, your plant takes up everything you give it. There's nothing running off. There's, it's not contaminating downstream waters. Um, and it's been a proven fact. And, and we, we have uh, well, about 800 acres of, of drip irrigation put in right now. It's very costly. Um, I think government uh, needs to step in and help farmers be more efficient. And uh, it would also create extra water for mun municipalities that need more water. So we could, we could trade for some of the cost. Um, I said drip irrigation is about $4,000 an acre. So it's like buying a farm over again. But um, like I say, it's just a matter of quality is what we're working on and, and we've achieved that. Um, like I said, I, I do appreciate the opportunity to tell my story. And we do um, several tours every year of people from the United States and uh, we've had people from China, um, Africa, all over the world actually coming to visit our farm. So um, my door is always open. If uh, you ever get an opportunity to come visit, we'd love to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Really appreciate that. I might ask just one quick follow-up question. Um, I think we have a little time for you to respond and we see if any, anyone else has follow-ups, but obviously you operate at a pretty large scale. Um, so what, what would your thoughts be on how to encourage these sorts of changes on other operations that maybe aren't at the scale that you guys are, um, like you, you brought up the expense of drip irrigation and the challenge probably of doing that for some operations. So what sort of ideas do you have, or what do you think is really the, the biggest challenge or kind of cross scales for operations making these sorts of changes? I think our biggest problem that we're, we have a tendency to over, um, fertilize, I think, in ag. Um, in our part of the country, the rule of thumb is a pound of N per bushel of corn you wanna raise. We're raising 300 bushel corn on 110 pounds of nitrogen. So it's amazing. But <clears throat> I see a lot of pivots running and the water running off the fields and into the gutters and down, going downstream. And if we could learn how to apply fertilizer at a less rate so it would absorb into the, into the ground instead of running off. I think that's a, that, that's be a big area we need to improve on. Excellent. Thanks. Um, well, we'll go ahead and turn to our next panelist, uh, Rochelle Krismark. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me uh, to participate in this panel today. And I think it's crucial that um, that farmers uh, are included in these conversations about finding solutions to environmental issues. And I'm passionate about the sustainability of on our farm, as well as connecting with the public to better understand the needs of our consumers, which is one reason why I'm a director on the United Soybean Board. Uh, the board works on behalf of all U.S. soybean growers, <laughs> Uh, to achieve value for their checkoff investments in programs that drive innovation in meal and oil and sustainability. And as uh, Robin mentioned, on our family farm, we grow soybeans, corn, forage grass, and cover crops. Our family also raises hogs and owns a cow-calf beef herd, so we're very diversified. Um, we were the first farm in our county to earn the Minnesota Water Quality Certification Program. Uh, 
so we're, we're proud of that. You know, we're stewards. Uh, our goal is to continually improve the soil and environment that's held in our care as we increase the economic efficiencies so that we can successfully transition to the next generation. And as far as sustainability now, well, U.S. farmers are not only committed to, but we're actively targeting the aspirational goals for sustainable development, where we can have a make positive contributions. Uh, and that's the biggest difference is at our farm, but also through our value chain. Um, sustainability, well, U.S. farmers, we're on track, and our goal is that we're committed to reduce land use impact, reduce soil erosion, uh, increased energy efficiencies. And part of that is by using the biofuels that we produce and also by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I think one of the goals for the future is for the US egg industry to be the global leader in sustainability. As far as water quality, well, protecting the water is important. And a variety of farm management techniques, including conservation tillage, uh, which we practice on our farm, we no-till and strip-till, nutrient management. Again, on our farm, we, we inject uh, all of our, our um, liquid nutrients from our livestock. And uh, so nutrient management and technology improvements in seed and equipment, that can all improve water quality as well as conserve water use, as, uh, as Rod mentioned. Managing water has economic benefits too. So technology, including precision agricultural applications and soil tests assist farmers to apply the right amount of nutrients and chemicals to each field and actually each area of every field. Um, this helps us reduce applications, improve water quality and improves profitability. Um, unfortunately, I think Sean McMahon was uh, from the Iowa Agriculture Water Alliance was not able to join us today as planned. So I'd like to take a couple extra minutes to share a couple of projects that the United Soybean Board uh, has funded. And I think Lisa Schulte Moore uh, may have referenced a couple of these projects um, in the February 4th workshop, but there was a project that was called um, the Native Perennial Filter Strips to Improve Water Quality and Biodiversity for Sustainable Soybean Production. And what that research um, from Iowa State University science-based trials of row crops it was called the STRIPS program. That established uh, permanent strips of diverse native vegetation called prairie strips on approximately 10% of soybean fields. And it showed that that can reduce soil and nutrient loss by over 80%. And it also provided um, or provides habitat for pollinators and wildlife. So it's a geospatial analysis, and, and I believe it was like on 150,000 acres of row crops in multiple states. Um, ISU is compiling those results of a cost-benefit analysis and practice to share with farmers and, and funders, I think, here in the new future. And there was a... And, uh, some other projects that Leif and uh, Ben talked about, um, one of them here in Minnesota, um, the, the Minnesota chapter of the Nature Conservancy, um, it involves like 18 partners, uh, NRCS and Trutera, and producers are working with, loyal, with local soil water conservation districts. Uh, to collect agronomic data and soil sampling. And all those results will be used to quantify soil carbon sequestration and reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve water quality outcomes. Purpose-driven, well, when we talk about a farmer's role in sustainability, we're purpose-driven business. 
So we understand that as raw material suppliers, we have an enormous impact on all levels of sustainability, including economic and and environmental sustainability. As far as environmental, well, our environmental practices make us globally competitive. And we must continue to improve our product's global competitiveness by innovating and adopting more sustainable practices. I think our capacity to make continuous improvements in our production practices using innovative technology will nudge us forward. And it's it's either going to make or break us in the future. And economics, well, improving on-farm practices and uh, available technology advances both efficiency and environmental resilience, improves the future profitability uh, of U.S. farming. Both contribute significantly to the future profitability and resilience in the economic realm. As far as sustainability from a global view, well, U.S. farmers have pursued sustainable practices for decades, not only for the benefit of our farms, but for the planet. Uh, We appreciate that today's consumers across the globe uh, demand sustainable products more now than ever. And they increasingly expect proof of of those sustainable practices. Uh, A lot like Richard, I've had the opportunity to, to travel and meet with a lot of our international customers and our domestic customers. And, um, they all want to know what we're doing on our farm. So we're, we're transparent and you can, you know, feel free to come visit us any day. Um, as far as soil health, I think that you can ask anybody in agriculture and they'll tell you that healthy soils sustain better and more efficient yields and produce higher quality products. And while the ag industry has adopted innovations in seed technology, equipment design, and precision planting strategies, the industry is also moving to aggregate and measure the beneficial effects of innovative soil management strategies. Um, Healthy soil response to extreme conditions like flooding and drought by more effectively letting rainwater flow in and gently releasing uh, the nutrients and the water to plants as as it's needed. Healthy maintained soil also requires fewer inputs like fertilizers and other treatments because it holds the nutrients rather than allowing them to leach. I'm proud to serve on the United Soybean Board because it invests in soil management projects, including the Soil Health Partnership. And some of the program's goals are to quantify the benefits of practices that support soil health from an economic as well as environmental standpoint. And I think it exhibits how healthy soils also increase the economic efficiencies. Next slide, please. So to summarize my points, I'm gonna leave you with these three words, stewardship, science, and solutions. Farmers are environmental stewards who use science-based research and data to make informed decisions and collaborate with partners to develop solutions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Rochelle. We'll go ahead and move to our next panelist, uh, Richard Wilkins. Joining us from the shop. (laughs) Good, Good afternoon. Uh, so I appreciate the opportunity to speak this afternoon. My uh, my colleagues Rod and Rochelle have done a, a very excellent job of uh, of relating some of the experiences that uh, that uh, we have as farmers in our industry. Uh, I want to spend some time uh, telling you a little bit about uh, about my uh, a journey uh, down this pathway of sustainability. Uh, and then uh, also, I want to leave you with uh, with some potential uh, risks of the uh, of what the future may lie. So, um, 2020 was the 47th year that I 
uh, planted that I had a crop that I planted a crop. Uh, Forty-seven seasons. Uh, maybe, hopefully, you not think that I'm uh, that old. Uh, the, the reason why it's been forty-seven seasons was because uh, my first crop with a risk, uh, personal risk in it, uh, was planted when I was thirteen years old. I uh, rented five acres uh, from a neighbor and uh, begged my father to allow me to use his uh, farm all tractors to uh, to be able to plant some soybeans. Uh, and uh, try to start to earning some money to put away in a savings account to be able to purchase my first automobile. I was a forward thinker even then. Uh, but, you know, that time, 1973, in our industry, uh, what was uh, epidemic was that many people, uh, non-farming people, looked upon farmers as being country pumpkins, as being hayseeds, uh, as being of low intellect, uh, I can remember my guidance counselor when I was entering middle school discouraging me from wanting to become a farmer. Uh, she said that my test scores were high enough that I should be on a pathway of academics and be college bound, uh, and I and I shouldn't be a farmer because uh, basically she was trying to say I was too smart to be a farmer. Uh, well, of course I defied her. Uh, and our industry, our trade associations, our, our, our representative organizations worked really hard uh, during the late 70s and the 80s uh, to reshape that image of what an American farmer was. Uh, we emphasized that agriculture was a business. And in many ways, agriculture was a, is a big business, uh, that agriculture was very uh, science-based and how much science that there was involved. Uh, our we were very successful uh, at changing that image of, of a farmer in agriculture. Uh, perhaps we were uh, too successful because then as we entered into the 21st century, uh, we started to have consumers and customers uh, expressing uh, fear uh, about the way that their food was being produced. They often it's been said that they want the latest technology and the latest science uh, in everything in their lives uh, except their food. And there's been a lot of criticism uh, in the last uh, 20 years about about our use of advanced plant breeding uh, uh, methods, uh, about our, our use of, of uh, synthetic uh, pesticides and synthetic fertilizer in order to optimize the amount of food that we're producing from each, uh, uh, from each unit of production. But I'm, I'm optimistic and really hopeful that, you know, over these last uh, four weeks so far, I've uh, been very ex has been impressed with the uh, with the uh, academia, uh, the presenters, uh, the work that they've been uh, that they've been doing research work, uh, and and I hope that that we are now on the cusp of the majority of consumers and customers seeing what the benefits are of utilizing all the greatest technology and science and innovation that we have available to us uh, in, order to, in order to optimize our food production, in order to deliver to them uh, the good nutrition, uh, you know, food is medicine, uh, and to be able to enrich their lives uh, by utilizing as few resources as we have to for each unit of production. And that's what we've been really, really great at in the United States at doing. I want to touch upon some of what potential unintended consequences that there could be. Uh, forgive me, I have an old barn cat that feels like she should uh, not have to go outside today. Uh, but, uh, you know, some of these uh, schemes uh, that are being uh, uh, talked about, potential uh, whether they're uh, government mandates, whether they're incentive-based programs. Uh, some of my fears is that the, the, either the food manufacturing companies or the food marketing companies, that they will be the ones to benefit the most from requiring uh, certification uh, or requiring uh, uh, labeling uh, on the products um, or maybe it would be the facilitators, the, the third-party certifying agencies, that they'll extract so much out of this, this uh, uh, added value of sustainable farming practices 
uh, that the producer will be basically left in the same spot that they were before. Uh, we'll have additional mandates or additional requirements imposed upon them uh, without any uh, greater uh, per unit profitability. And then the unintended consequence will be, of this would be an, an even further explosion in the amount of consolidation within the American agriculture system. You know, it, if a uh, and then another potential risk is that the industry could become vertically integrated. You know, it's if you take a take a look at a at a large company, and if there, if the consumers or the NGOs uh, or governmental entities are telling them, imposing upon them requirements that say you must source all of your re- all of your uh, all of your uh, components for making your products uh, from sustainable farms. Well, would they rather deal with a hundred farms versus ten thousand farms? So if they they would they would offer those greatest advantages only to the largest farm operators, and that's what I mean by the unintended consequence and the risk is that we could be past going down this uh, this pathway of even further consolidation and also the risk of vertical integration. Uh, I enjoy what I'm doing. I uh, scaled my farm up to at one point three thousand acres. Uh, we then uh, decided that that we would change our crop mix and, and work on adding, adding more value. Uh, we're now down to, to under 1,000 acres. Uh, it's, it's an enjoyable way of life, and I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I'd be glad to answer any questions that anybody may have. Great. Thank you so much, Richard. That was excellent. Um, I think we'll just we'll move to Jenny's comments, and then I think we will just be opening it up for discussion for the full panel and, and our earlier speakers to join as well. So I've queued up a few questions that have been popping up, um, but we'll circle back to that in a minute. So Jenny. Thank you. And I need to thank Kurt because he gave a great kind of precursor to some of what I'm going to talk about today, just in terms of supply chains and their involvement uh, with nitrogen fertilizer. So um, maybe just a brief bit about Environmental Defense Fund. Um, we work on a number of pressing environmental issues. And one of those has been for a number of years, um, impacts from fertilizer runoff um, and fertilizer that's uh, lost to the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas. And we spent a lot of time early on, probably starting 20 years ago or so, focused in the Chesapeake Bay, working with farmers to understand what were the practices that could be deployed that would help them you know, manage risk and also um, still produce the yields they wanted and minimize loss to the environment of fertilizer in particular. And we did a lot of that work and found some ways to be successful, but um, also realized that it wasn't scaling and that we needed a way to get more resources um, kind of dedicated to this effort. And so um, that kind of leads us to another part of Environmental Defense Fund, which is where I work, which is our private sector partnerships. Um, and so in that capacity, we um, partner with leading companies to try and advance our environmental goals as a nonprofit. Uh, we don't take money from our corporate partners. And so we're really trying to find ways um, to maximize the environmental benefit, um, just as a little bit of context. So. I want to maybe share a little bit about just the timeline from my perspective and some of the highlights we've seen in terms of corporate engagement on the issue of nitrogen fertilizer. And um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So Kurt mentioned this as well, um, field to market. I kind of say that was maybe uh, an early step towards more corporate engagement in this space. The organization formed in 2006 and later became its own nonprofit, um, but it had some food brands involved um, from the beginning. And that was really focused on the sustainability of row crop production, which until that point hadn't, I think, been very high on the list of priorities um, for food companies at that point had been more focused on commodities tied to deforestation um, in other countries in particular. And so I would say from there, momentum started building and then go to the next slide. Um, in 2011, the Fertilizer Institute 
launched uh, their four R's program. So really trying to bring this idea of fertilizer stewardship more to the forefront and doing kind of outreach along those lines as this issue was getting more attention and, and picking up a little more momentum. Then if you go to the next slide, I would say in 2013, things really picked up when Walmart launched an initiative um, focused on what they called fertilizer optimization. And this was part of an effort that Walmart had really focused on actually um, addressing greenhouse gases in their supply chain. And so where EDF had for a long time been focused on the water quality impacts from fertilizer runoff, um, we realized that as more and more companies were setting climate targets, um, and as you started digging into the hotspots of where companies had a lot of greenhouse gas impacts in their supply chains, fertilizer uh, tended to actually be pretty high on the list in terms of um, size of impact, as well as kind of a ready set of tools to be deployed that could help, um, help minimize some of that impact. So in 2013, Walmart launched their fertilizer optimization program. And in that they challenged a number of their kind of leading brands, leading suppliers um, to set fertilizer goals over the next five years uh, to really try and figure out, you know, what could work, um, how could they engage in these really complex supply chains that, as Kurt mentioned earlier. And so from there, a number of companies like Smithfield, um, Smithfield Foods, a big pork producer, Campbell Soup Company, and others developed goals for how they wanted to engage their supply chains. And so from there, if you go to the next slide, there was, because of Walmart, there was this momentum and work that was starting to happen. And then I would say the issue got more and more attention. Um, so this here in 2017, a group called Mighty Earth released, um, they're kind of more of an activist NGO and they released this report really focusing in on fertilizer impacts in the companies who have a lot of grain in their supply chain. So a lot of uh, retail, restaurant, food brands that have a lot of uh, meat in particular in their supply chains, as well as, you know, corn, wheat, and soy. And so I would say like through these years, um, EDF was partnering with companies to work on some of these initiatives. We were trying lots of different approaches. Um, I would say they all had a, a certain common element of how do we get resources whether that's technical assistance, whether that's additional funding, like how do we get resources into the hands of farmers um, so that these practic practices can be adopted um, more widely. And I think we saw a lot of things fail <laughs> um, and a few things that actually I think worked out fairly well. Uh, two examples to maybe highlight if you go to the next slide include Smithfield Foods. So they uh, set a goal in 2013 when Walmart asked them to engage in the topic that they wanted to improve the sustainability, the fertilizer and soil health on 75% of the grain acres um, they sourced as feed for their hogs. And they were able to um, then successfully meet and exceed that goal, um, which they announced in 2019. They had reached over 560,000 acres. And I think one of the keys to their success is that they were, in fact, doing direct grain procurement with the farmers. And so uh, the length of the conversation between the food company and the farmer was very short. So you didn't have to translate it through multiple steps in the supply chain. And I think it allowed Smithfield uh, to more quickly understand what would be helpful um, from the farmer's perspective and how could they tailor engagement, whether that was increasing the number of agronomists on their staff to provide uh, technical assistance. Uh, at one point, they, they bought some optical sensors that they would loan to farmers to use um, so they could try them out from a precision fertilizer application standpoint. And so uh, they were able to find a model that worked. Um, and that worked from the standpoint, too, I think of kind of who pays for this, which, you know, strikes me as a, a theme throughout a lot of the presentations. And I think one of the biggest challenges, um, you know, I, I think Richard mentioned this um, in his comments just a moment ago that, you know, I think a, a perception that brands potentially have a lot to gain from this work, but I think at the same time, 
you know, they're typically selling through a retailer, um, through a fast food restaurant chain, um, basically through entities who are not interested in charging their customers more for a product. And so I think there is this conundrum of, you know, how much does it cost to really do this and who should pay for it? And how do you create a, a system that then can scale impact? Um, and so in this instance, I think Smithfield found a model that provided enough business value in terms of strengthening relationships with farmers, being able to source more grain locally, so cutting down on transportation costs, that they could basically find the business case without being able to charge a price premium for their end product. I would say a lot of other companies haven't been as fortunate to kind of find that sweet spot um, that allows them to fund the program long term and, you know, not need a retailer or a a restaurant to kind of okay a price increase. Another example, if you go to the next slide of maybe a, a success story is Campbell Soup Company. So they were also part of that original cohort um, of 15 major suppliers that Walmart asked to set goals. And their goal was actually around um, improving fertilizer use on wheat. Um, so they targeted 70,000 acres of wheat and, and their approach was to partner with Truterra, um, which was formerly Land O'Lakes, to really kind of use a model where you go to the farmer's trusted advisor. So in this instance, like the local ag retailer as the point of information transfer and technical assistance. So instead of creating a new person uh, that a farmer would need to engage with, instead um, really focusing in on a relationship that was strong and existing um, to be the conduit for that information. And so Campbell Soup was able to successfully reach their goal, which they announced this year. Um, and so I think <laughs> there are some cases where this has worked. I don't think that any of it has scaled as quickly or as broadly as we wanted it to. Um, I think, again, because who pays for this is still um, a big challenge. And I think also to Kurt's earlier point around certifications, um, they're valuable because they would presumably allow a brand like a Smithfield or a Campbell Soup Company to promote, a, you know, a, a more premium product, but um, without like a, a high quality third party verified standard, most retailers or other retail outlets probably wouldn't permit that or encourage it or promote it because of a legal liability issue. And so you get stuck in this conundrum where you're then forced, if you do a standard, to have a segregated supply chain, to have a more expensive product again, and then likely not an ability to scale beyond the small percentage of consumers who are willing to pay more for that kind of premium sustainability product. So I think the big takeaway for me from all of this work is that there's no silver bullet. You know, we need lots of different interventions to help farmers get the resources they need to succeed and to create the incentives that will perpetuate that long-term. And I think part of our work with companies as we've done more and more of this is to also just think about how can we use their voices in the policy landscape to help advocate for programs that will help farmers and help increase conservation programs um, and funding um, towards that end. So I'll maybe stop there. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jenny. Uh, well, at this point, we're going to bring back all of the speakers. So our kind of first part of the session speakers, all of our panelists who just gave comments, if you can all turn your videos on, that will bring you onto the webcast. Um, and uh, we are monitoring questions in Slack also for kind of participants within the, the panels to post questions. I'll keep an eye on that. But I think I will start with one that I think is somewhat distracted perhaps to the farmer, but when I see Ken's hand raised, so Ken will be up next. Um, directed maybe a bit to the farmer participants, but if others have thoughts, something that strikes me a lot, and I grew up on a farm and my family is very active in conservation and you all shared really great success stories of the way that you've managed to solve some of these problems. So why is it that not everyone's doing it? Because <laughs> I feel like, you know, you hear these success stories, you see lots of great examples of people finding a way either through their own personal motivation or through the, you know, the positive economic benefits, they're finding ways to do it. But yet our kind of, you know, cover crops are only 5% of the land is in cover crops, you know, less than half is in limited tillage, like how, what is really going on there? And I was thinking of like Rod's example, we know larger farms often 
um, are more engaged in these things because of economies of scale and being able to do it. Um, we also know more diverse farms with livestock integrated tend to benefit more from practices. And that seems to be the case with maybe Richard and Rochelle. So I'm wondering if you're kind of examples of some of the patterns we see out there. Um, and if you have thoughts on, on how we turn the majority into the successes that you're having. Yeah, I, I could um, speak on that for a second here. We deal directly um, in the food chain business. So we, for instance, Walmart, we deal directly with Walmart, Safeway, Albertsons, um, and they require us to meet their satisfaction, you know, to meet their guidelines. And we have to implement this or we lose the business. So um, does that answer your question? From it does. I mean, you have a, you have a strong economic motivation <laughs> um, that this is part of the relationship have, but maybe because of your direct relationship with the, um, with that part of the market. Yeah. But they still don't understand the extra inputs we have to go through to make up for that cost. So we're yeah. still working on, on trying to figure that part of the, you know, the process out. So, yeah. Okay. Michelle or Richard? Uh, yes. Yeah, so from, from our perspective, um, our customers for, you know, soybeans more than corn, because most of our corn, uh, we, we live in a, in a, in an area that is corn negative. So all, most all the corn goes for livestock feed or ethanol production. But our soybeans, a lot of them also go for livestock production, the meal does. But a lot of our customers, um, like I mentioned earlier, they, they want that qualification that our products are grown sustainably. And um, so we need to verify that. And the, the United Soybean Board has worked with uh, the U.S. Soybean Export Council to develop a, a soybean sustainability uh, protocol called SSAP. And it's third party vol uh, verified. And I believe there's about 95% of the soybeans are produced under this uh, qualification. So um, there again, if, if we want consumers and our customers to purchase uh, our products, we need to verify the sustainability. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing a market demand theme. The market is demanding it. <laughs> yeah. And that's okay. Different ways, but... yeah. And that's okay because um, it's, it's the right thing to do. It's mm -hmm. best management practices. Mm -hmm. Richard, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I do, Robin. That's a, that's a very, very excellent question. So uh, let me answer it first with a story. So you know, when I was a young person uh, learning to farm from, from my father, uh, my father instilled in me that uh, you know, cover cropping, uh, growing a crop during the winter months was just something that you did. Uh, it was, uh, it was a normal practice. He, he couldn't really explain exactly to me why, other than, you know, you were, you were, uh, uh providing a, a conservation, uh, to the soil. Uh, my mother explained it. He said, well, the Wilkins family is very stingy and they're very tight and they don't want to see anything wasted. So we didn't want to waste our soil. Uh, we didn't want to waste, uh, Un, unused plant nutrients. Uh, so we grew cover crops during the winter time in order to do that. So, you know, cover cropping in our family has just been a standard practice and a way of life. And I tell that story to make my point that I believe that the reality is that the majority of farmers are doing these things. Okay. We don't 
it's in the farmer's best interest to make sure that they optimize the pounds of plant nutrients that they apply to each crop. To do a thorough analysis of what the what the expectation, what the yield potential is uh, of each uh, production unit, and only to apply the amount of resources that are needed in order to meet that optimum yield. Uh, the, so I would say that we already are doing these things. It's just that in many cases, many farmers aren't telling their story mm. and aren't talking about it. So that's uh, so. I, yes, as I said in my in my you know my opening. We are on this journey and this pathway uh, towards, you know, there is no point in time where you can say, okay, I've got here, I'm sustainable now. It's a pathway of continuous improvement. And, and each production season, we're trying to be better than we were the year before. Yeah. yeah, the other theme I'm hearing, which is, again, consistent with what I would expect, but is also a conservation ethic, that you all have a strong conservation ethic, you know, in addition to perhaps some of those external pressures to meet qualifications and to meet the demand that's there. But I think that conservation ethic is critical. And it sounds like you were raised with that, Richard. So um, there's all kinds of questions flowing in. So I'm going to um, hand it off to Ken to ask a question. Oh, you're on mute, Ken. We see you, but How's that? that's How's perfect. That? Okay. So I have a quick comment and a question. The and the comment, and it's to the three uh, first speakers, um, the effectiveness of policies and markets that address the end problem in agriculture ultimately depend on the ability to identify end loss reduction options for which we have robust estimates about how much they reduce end losses. The challenge is though, that we often lack the capacity to make such estimates across the wide range of soils, and climates, and production systems in U.S. agriculture. So my question to the speakers, uh, uh, Lay, Kurt, and Kurt, what steps are taken by companies and government programs to ensure that the management practices being promoted actually deliver the benefits that they are receiving subsidies or environmental service payments for? Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thoughts from the first couple of speakers? Well, I mean, I'll hop in just because we're, we're in the process of standing up a, you know, a pilot for the ecosystem service market. You know, that is very much so an outcome-based program, right? Um, it's not necessarily tied to incentive payments or farm bill programs, but it, it, it very much so is a performance-based you know, program much like the normal marketplaces that we're familiar with are in that, you know, if, if you don't see the change in the soil, you know, at, at that five-year kind of soil test true up, like, you know, there's, there's a consequence there. So it, it, it there's that, and I don't know, the, 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 there's a lot to unpack in that statement, but uh, it, uh, I, I think there's, there's, there's growing, growing questions on on both and not only the you know like is this is the change actually happening but also what's the return on investment of some of these programs just on on a broad level both for the farm and for the environmental you know outcome that we're, we're seeking to to achieve um just to follow up on that uh ken that's a great question and you know i i can't speak nationally but i can have knowledge of what's going on in the, the Chesapeake. And that's a, that's a real challenge. It's a real challenge, um, you know, in our, in our cost share programs, as well as the, the, the trading programs that have been developed here, that it, it, they develop tools. And basically what we end up doing is counting practices. And, um, you know, we don't have, at least, you know, in our neck of the woods, we don't have these intermediate metrics that we measure by like uh leaf was suggesting you know like soils or you know soil p levels or anything like that you know so we don't have this we don't have a strong connection other than the models that we trust that um that there's a connection between practices and you know demonstrated outcomes and i can tell you for a fact that uh you know if you look that that 
we're, we're struggling with that right now in the Chesapeake. We've been at this for 30 years and we're looking at the water quality outcomes in terms of nitrogen, estimating nitrogen and phosphorus loads coming over the fall line at various in various rivers contributing to the Chesapeake Bay. And we're just not seeing a strong signal. So there's a disconnect somewhere. Any other follow-up thoughts on that? I had a kind of a, I guess, a question playing off of that that I'll raise. It's just related to this question. It just struck me, and it was in Leah's comments originally about, you know, paying for practices versus predicted or modeled outcomes, like you're talking about, Kurt, or, or actual outcomes. But, I mean, how in the world would you ever hold a, people accountable to actual outcomes at the scale that would be necessary? So I know, like, with the TNC project, it seems that's an example where you are measuring actual outcomes. but that seems like a gigantic undertaking. And if, and if I remember right, we maybe tried that in the past before too, and it's nearly impossible to pull off. So I'm just curious if people, and in the farmer panel too, I'm very curious if you have thoughts about, um, yeah, because I think we have a lot of question marks about why these programs aren't working. And is it that we have bad expectations about what the potential effects of some of these interventions are, or is it because something else going on in the natural system that's hiding that signal? Um, so I'm just curious what, what thoughts people have. So I, I, I like the idea of shifting towards measuring actual outcomes and paying for that, but thoughts about how we would actually do that. I mean, I mean, I think that, you know, there's, I think the situation depends on the type of agriculture and the type of situation you're talking about. But I think that, you know, there are, as suggests, there are intermediate indicators that you could use in terms of, you know, for instance, phosphorus, P levels, soil P levels, and um, you know, and they people have tried various other types of mechanisms. So, um, uh, you know, I mean, there was a, there was a pilot program in West Virginia that 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 rewarded a group of landowners who could move the needle of nitrate levels at the at the outlet of a watershed. Um, so, um, you know, and it wasn't it wasn't punitive or anything like that. It's like it was a performance payment. So, you know, it's, it's, and oh, and the other thing is, you know, and if you're dealing with large scale systems, like if you have vertically integrated systems, you know, you, where you have large stores of nitrogen in manure and, you know, you're treating those, those large movements of nutrients are, and particularly if you like a waste to energy project are, 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 are directly measurable and easy to track. So in some instances that is, it depends on the type of agriculture and type of system you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So I think it's creative. I don't think there's a one size fits all type of a, I know that's cliche, but I don't, but, but I think you have to sort of look at the circumstances and try to figure out, well, you know, where can we insert some indicators there to, to measure outcomes? Well, and I, I also don't think we're going to get that, you know, like, you know, we're just in the process of launching a, a big kind of edge of field strategy, you know, push in that, like, we're not going to get, we're not going to meet our water quality outcomes by looking at infield practices alone, right? And and especially kind of in the face of 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 of, of our changing climate, in that you know that doesn't matter if you're doing soil health or, or reduced tillage or whatever. Like if we get three inches of rain in an hour, there's going to be sediment and nutrients leaving that field, and so we need that second line of defense kind of set up and and in place to help mitigate that impact. And, 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 and so it, anyway that's part of it too and, and part of that ties into what scale you, you're talking about your outcome you know like hinted at it or like what scale are we thinking about outcomes at so um anyway i'll just leave it there so so i'd like to i'd like to bring up two points um one i think the the matrix that we use to um analyze or measure organic matter or whatever nutrients are in the soil is, is pretty diverse. And we have seen um, samples that, you know, when you, when you take a soil sample uh, and we've, we've participated in, in equip and in um, other uh, conservation practices, you know, through NRCS and, and local soil water and everything, CSP programs and stuff. But when you're, when you're taking a soil sample, I've seen a, a pretty big difference in 
for instance, the measurement of organic matter. You can take a vial and it'll give you one measurement. And then if you take a root hair and, and take it out of that same sample, that sample might change six tenths of a percent. So if you're getting paid um, to increase your organic matter by say 0.3%, where are you gonna get that sample from? And so that's one of my concerns and a, and a point that I wanted to make. And the other one is that, I think it was alluded to uh, before is that as part of the nitrogen problem I think is in the you know, several years ago, um, animal agriculture was encouraged to apply liquid nutrients according to the N value. And what we've found is that that's over application. And so what we do is we apply our liquid nutrients from our hog barns, from the pits, according to the P value and then we spoon feed the nitrogen as the plant needs it. And it's not only better for the environment, but it's more economical. Uh, I can't remember, I think it was a rod that mentioned, um, you know, you, you can produce, you know, 240 bushel corn on 140 pounds of N in, in our soils here in Southern Minnesota with no problem. Um, I'll tell you that we, we rented some ground uh, on a two-year lease and produced corn on it last year. And all we did was apply nitrogen, no other nutrients, and had hardly any rain uh, after the 4th of July and still produced 190 bushel corn on that ground. And it is not premium Southern Minnesota soil on those two farms. So we're, we're doing uh, a lot of conservation practices. I, I think the majority, I think Richard said it too. Um, farmers use agronomic consultants and soil samples because part of it is economics. It's not only, like I said earlier, uh, it's an innate characteristic in farmers that we just want to care for our soil because you know um, that if you take care of the soil, it's going to take care of all of us, not just produce better crops, but it's, it's better for, for everybody. And so uh, I'm not saying that we're all doing everything right. And it's definitely continuous improvement. And I really appreciate the technology in the 41 years that I've been a farmer. I, of, of anything, I appreciate the technology so that we can use science um, to make better decisions. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rochelle. Um, Leah, I saw you were going to reply. Yes, I thank you. I have a follow-up comment that's going to generate a question for the farmers on the call. So first of all, I think this is a fantastic discussion because it really highlights a serious challenge with our pay for performance programs and that it is very difficult to measure these outcomes. And I think this links back to the question Kathy posed to me earlier about the scale at which we are trying to motivate management changes. It's really difficult for me to envision that we are going to be able to accurately track outcomes if we're only impacting a relatively small proportion of the landscape, right? If only a relatively small proportion of the manager land managers are making a practice change, uh, we may not be able to detect the outcome um, unless we really invest in some high cost sensors or something like that. But with our current technologies, we probably won't be able to measure it. And so then if we plan to hold people accountable for outcomes, I think we'll end up with a situation where people will be very risk averse and worried that they will take costly actions 
and they will not be credited for doing so because an outcome may not be able to be measured. So the way that I think this links to Kathy's comment is that leads us to a question of whether we can have uh, farmers coming together in collaborative ways to impact a larger area of a watershed. And so my question to the farmers on the call is, it, do you see opportunities there of creating programs for more collaboration or does that you know, kind of ruffle your feathers and make you say, oh my gosh, there's a lot of work that that's going to take. And I don't know how much I want to work with all the neighbors around me to, to make this happen. What, what is your reaction to that idea of group programs and mechanisms? Thank you. They're thinking about it. No, I, for, for us, um, being one of the largest shipper growers of onions, we have to work with our neighbors because we can't produce enough and still have a four year rotation on our 4,000 acres to make it work. So they are learning with us. Um, there is no, well, I, I shouldn't say there is none, but um, I have not heard of any class or uh, what do I want to call it? Uh, a program where you can go sit and listen and have them make us aware of all the things that we could be doing better. Um, I said American farmers come a long way and um, we, we continually want to get better. If I could, uh, if I could also, so uh, the city I farm in here in Delaware, so long about 1997. So for, okay, Delaware about about three percent of the water that drains into the Chesapeake Bay comes from Delaware. But because we are in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, uh, we're uh, we're under the magnifying glass. Uh, so in 1997, here in our state, we started devising a a uh, a pathway. Uh, based primarily upon education and based upon voluntary participation in incentive-based programs. So we established a, a uh, basically a voluntary nutrient management program, uh, whereby uh, you know it did require that you receive a minimum number of hours of of classroom education uh, in order to become uh, certified. And then, uh, and then you had to receive continuing education credits uh, in order to keep your certification. Uh, but there was no stick. The governor at that time, uh, Tom Carper, our governor at that time, who's now, uh, uh, in, I believe he's now the uh, chairman of the Senate uh, Environment and Public Works Committee. Uh, but he, he said, uh, let's do it the Delaware way. Uh, let's create a program based upon voluntary compliance, based upon education, uh, based upon providing financial incentives in order to to uh, to adopt good behavior, positive reinforcement rather than rather than the, the, the negative stick. And it worked. It worked. Uh, we had. We, I can remember a situation where a, a poultry farmer in my community uh, had the flock of chickens had gone out. Uh, the poultry manure was removed from the production facilities, uh, but was he didn't have the manure shed, so it was outside on the pads of the chicken house. And then he had a heart attack, and he had no family members to help. Well, the community got together and went and, and moved that poultry manure uh, and got it, uh, got it uh, protected, either undercover or applied on some productive fields, because we didn't want the social, we didn't want the, the social kickback uh, of a farm being seen uh, with manure uh, staged uh, outside of the production area. So you know, that was that was collaboration. Uh, now, unfortunately, what happened here in Delaware was about ten years ago, and Leah may be able to correct me, uh, but about ten years ago the Region 3 EPA administrator came to Delaware and said, we don't like your voluntary program. 
We don't like that your Department of Agriculture oversees it. It should be under the Department of Environmental Control. And this, and, and, and they wanted to impose many mandates and restrictions upon us, and they were successful at threatening to withhold federal funding for our incentive-based programs in order to make us change our laws. Now the farmers say the government is just regulating us. So, they, so in my opinion, there was a lot of damage that was done to a very, very good program by bringing a stick in and trying to, and trying to force us uh, to adopt even stricter uh, rules and regulations. Rochelle, did you have anything to add? It looked like maybe you were going to. Yeah, uh, so we, we experienced something kind of similar in Minnesota a few years ago with, um, with the, the buffer mandate. And it was in response uh, to, to trying to um, reduce runoff into, into the water streams. And so there was a, uh, just a blanket law passed that any um, public water, anything that drained into public water, had to have a 50-foot buffer. Um, it, I said for years that there is no such thing as common sense because it's not common. It should be called practical sense. And my point in in sharing that is that there is no practical sense in requiring a 50 foot buffer to a, a open drainage ditch that has a negative slope and nothing, nothing, uh, nothing slopes into it. Right. So um, I would, I would agree with Richard that uh, incentives to collaborate and develop partnerships uh, across this. And quite frankly, that is why I agreed to participate in this workshop, because I think any partnerships and relationships that we can develop are going to have a better solution to concerns and issues than any stick. Well, I personally love the idea of 20 to 30 farmers within a small scale, like Huck 12 watershed getting together, figuring out a collective solution and being able to measure that impact at that scale. And I think we've talked about doing that here in Ohio as a way of addressing, you know, water quality issues locally. So um, it's good to get your, get your thoughts on that. Um, David has had his hand raised for a while. So I'm going to um, call on David to answer his question, or ask his question. Thank you. Can you can you hear me and see me? Yes, we can. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you so much for a great a great session today. Um, I, two things that I wanted to get the particularly the, the the first few speakers to to respond to. One, you know, the, and this is building on Ken Kassman's comment about the difficulty of of actually monitoring practice adoption and 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 outcomes. And I was just wondering, uh, keen to hear their thoughts on other bottlenecks in the broader agri-food system that might be easier to monitor. So for example, we had a paper out a couple of years ago um, putting forward an, uh, a case for um, imposing design standards or performance standards on fertilizer products and their fertilizer manufacturers would be the ones that would be um, uh, monitored for that. Uh, it's similar in the ways that the cafe standards for cars have been done. Instead of monitoring the driving habits of 120 million drivers, you monitor the production uh, uh, or you, you, you enforce production um, standards on a smaller number of companies. And there are several other examples of that. So that was just one thing, just thinking kind of beyond the farm in some way, beyond this more traditional policymaking relationship of either government to farm or these other private sector initiatives if they're more innovative ways. And, and second to that, you know, and this is the way a lot of policy in this area often is, is, is drafted, but it's often within the existing system. And by that, I mean, you know, probably some of the more transformative change that is going to happen 
are going to be from from changes that have nothing to do with <laughs> incremental changes in nitrogen use efficiency. Uh, you know, it will be to do with the fact once consumers realize that an impossible Whopper tastes the same as a normal Burger King Whopper, right? Um, or it'll be once uh, these startups that are promoting um, nitrogen fixing corn actually take root and, and work, for example, just to give a couple of examples. And so in that context, policy uh, plays a different role, right? In terms of either reducing regulatory barriers or making sure that they, you know, meet certain standards. So I was just interested in hearing the, 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 the panel's thoughts on those two things. One on kind of looking at other parts in the agri-food system that might be easier to, to, to implement policy on and what the role of policy is in these areas of more transformative change. Thank you. Thank you, David. Looks like Leah's gonna jump in. Well, I, I do have a, a comment to your first question. Um, I know that in the past five years, there's been some really innovative work done trying to work directly with ag retailers. And Robin can speak to this probably more than me because I believe you've been involved with some of this work, Robin. Uh, but specifically, I know in the Western Lake Erie Basin, trying to work through these ag retailers who influence a larger portion of the landscape, right? So if the point that we're making is that we need to scale up, and figure out you know, what levers would help us do that, then maybe working with those individuals who then go out and work with farmers um, is, a, is a good approach. And so I, I can't speak to a lot of the results because I haven't been directly involved with those projects, but I've really uh, been very interested in that. And I think it's a, a neat uh, approach. Yeah, and we have seen, um, well, Carrie Volmer Sanders shared, I think a slide was it just in the workshop this last week and showed that we are seeing some positive effect of working with the certified retailers, still trying to kind of tease out what that, that effect is at the end of the day. But, um, but we also see a um, high level of loyalty among farmers to their current nutrient service providers. So they're not necessarily going to switch to a certified one. Um, but if they're working with a certified one, then certainly we're seeing some, I think, some positive impact on like the field level um, management. Well, well and I, I think just, oh, yeah, go ahead, Kurt. I was just going to say, like, on that note, I, you know, it, it, we have a board member who's a, a, a hog farmer in Southern Minnesota and, and, and she'll, you know, she talks about her agronomy team. I, you know, I just making sure that like the conservation staff at an SWCD or NRCS is kind of integrated into that, you know, agronomic team is, is, is so important, right? Like so many of these practices, they're just straight up not going to work if, if you're, if, if that side of the operation isn't on board with it. So it, it anyway, I'll just leave it with that. It, it just, it's just such an important part of this that, that the entire system get integrated and that yeah. it's not viewed as a, there's the agronomy, the, the agronomy side of things and then there's the conservation side of it, it needs to be. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to, I, I didn't have anything to add other than to say, second what David said, because I thought it was spot on. Um, and, you know, some of that, you know, and, and I just add to that, you know, you think about, well, you know, what happens if the, the entire, you know, fleet of cars goes to electric in 30 years, and then you and all of a sudden ethanol demand dries up. I mean, there's just, you think about those types of things. Um, but I do think that's, I do think that's a very, productive way to think about the problem. And that's why I was one of the things I was thinking about in terms of intervention in a in an integrated type of a system. Like we talk about poultry, where you have a vertical integration through the whole system and, you know, changing the liability rules so you can manage, you know, that that whole waste stream differently because you're you're you're, you're taking the management of waste out of from the individual growers and putting it into into the vertically integrated system and making the integrators responsible for the waste, you know, things like that would, you know, I, I think that that sort of fits into the spirit of what you're talking about. And, um, you know, on the urban side, for instance, it doesn't relate to nitrogen, but you know, in the, you know, they're talking about, you know, for phosphorus, phosphorus bands and, and urban fertilizers, for instance, that would be another sort of a system type of change that you're talking about, David. Um, um, but further up or further back, depending on, you know, further up in the, causal chain or further back in the causal chain where there's these big, you know, system changes that you can make or, or societal changes that are pressing. I think it's just an, it's, it's an excellent point that we shouldn't lose sight of. 
Can I just jump in about yes. supply chain standards and MSIs? I mean, they, you know, in terms of, of vertical integration, there's, you know, they really are working across the supply chain. They tend not to work with the ag retailers, as far as I know, and there really is separate data collection going on there. And if you, you know, if you sort of bring these data collection efforts together, I know the, the um, some of the calculators actually allow you to like import some data you may have entered in like Syngenta's tool or something like that. Um, but, you know, once once we sort of get everyone together, I think I think the, uh, the you know the data can be exchanged a little bit easier there. Excellent. Uh, any other thoughts on that before we move to the next question? Well, I was just going to add that um, we've been doing that in one of our pilot projects um, that we have with Tyson Foods, where our science team has been doing a lot of work on using nitrogen balance as a metric, you know, to both kind of understand how much fertilizer, both manure and synthetics being added to a field, and then looking at how much crop and residues being removed, using that as the proxy for how much is then vulnerable to loss. And so we've been building that science into tech platforms like Farmers Business Network, so that they can do the outreach with the farmer, collect all of that data, be able to do the calculations to have at least, instead of just counting practices, something that is more outcome based um, to then connect back to the effort that you know Tyson is doing as part of their supply chain. And so I do think there's some progress being made to try and make those connections between the tech platforms and some of the other supply chain efforts. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, we have a question from Eric. Eric, do you want to turn on your video and ask your question? Hi, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so interestingly, I, this morning I, I, I listened to a uh, seminar put on by um, The Economist magazine, and they had experts talking about the carbon um, issue of carbon sequestration in agriculture. And they were struggling with many of the same issues here about uh, verification. And it, I can't help but think that maybe this is, there's a cultural issue that we have here that we that we're so worried about, um, I don't know whether it's worried about cheaters or whether we're worried about um, being able to prove that in each and every case that we apply a policy or an incentive that it's going to have an impact on that particular farm. And if it doesn't, it's not fair for that farmer to get, get the payment. Um, you know, in public policy, but in, in other areas of public policy, we deal on averages. You know, whether it's um, some policy that, that is implemented to try to hope that people get better health care or better nutrition or, or maybe tax policy that's going to influence people's behaviors. We don't actually audit to see it really did influence each individual's behavior, but we have the policy is based on enough, enough experience um, that we know that on average, if enough people adopt it, it will have, a, it will have an impact. And there may be some cases where it won't have an impact. So cover crops may not work everywhere. Um, and uh, they have to be a different kind of cover crop in some place than in others. But in general, um, if we have enough research and enough confidence that applying a certain best practice, best management practice, is on average likely to yield a result, whether it be better carbon sequestration or less erosion or better nitrogen management, on average, it's going to have a benefit for the region or for the country or for, for society in general. Um, so why do we have to put so much emphasis on validation of the policy impact at the individual farm level if we can take another approach of simply validating that, yeah, um, a best management practice has been uh, implemented, they've followed the rules, and it maybe it didn't work on this par farm, but it probably is working on five other farms. And so at the end of the day, it's probably yielding um, the advantage that we want for society. Um, can, can we not um, make our job a little easier by going to um, verifiable things rather than trying to actual me measure 
the change in carbon content in the soil or the change in nitrogen content or the change in nitrogen leaching or the change in nitrous oxide emissions, which are you know, totally impractical to try to measure on, on very many farms, let alone a, a lot of farms. So I'd be interested in hearing um, a response, of anyone um, uh, from either of the panels who'd like to respond. Uh, don't get into the free. That's all. Leah, you want to go first? No, go ahead, Richard. Uh, well, thank you. You just remute. There you go. Okay, go ahead. Very good. We can hear you now. So, so Rochelle had mentioned something in her opening presentation called the United States Soybean Sustainability Assurance Protocol. And uh, I, at first, uh, you know, Eric, that's a, a, an excellent question. You know, why can't we be more concerned about the aggregate? And as long as we are, are moving the bubble, as long as we are becoming better in the aggregate, why is that not enough? Well, the United States Soybean Sustainability Assurance Protocol is kind of based on that. It's based on the fact that 97% of the soybean acres in the United States are grown on acres with a USDA conservation plan. That means that that land has to be in compliance with, uh, with all federal government conservation compliance standards in order to be able to qualify for uh, EQIP, in order to be able to qualify for Title I Farm Bill Support Programs, in order to be able to qualify in many areas for crop insurance. So in the aggregate, those soybeans are being produced in a sustainable manner. So, uh, yeah, I, and, and as the, some of the points that I made in my opening presentation about the unintended consequences of adding in all of this extra expense of third-party certifying agencies, the extra expense of laboratory fees in order to prove something. Uh, yeah, I think that if, if we concentrate more so on uh, incentive-based uh, positive reinforcement programs to help cost share. Farmers, we want to do the right thing. We're willing to invest our own money into longer-term conservation practices as long as we are, are able to get some cost share assistance to help implement those long-term practices. And, and so, yeah, yeah I, I totally agree. Let's concentrate on providing continuous improvement in the aggregate rather than being specifically looking at each and every individual farm. I, yeah. I, think, I think another, um, to add to Richard's points is that the incentives or the cost share need to be managed at a more regional or local level instead of a federal level because um, to Eric's point in question or comments is that um, practices are, are very different by region or, or by soil types or what watershed even you're in. And so uh, one of the concerns of the agriculture, the production agricultural organizations is that uh, we don't try to make blanket policies that are tried to make all of us fit in to a cookie cutter, right? Um, any more than I don't want to be told what color car I need to drive, right? So um, I think that's something to keep in mind. Yeah. Leah? Leah? Yes, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, one of the reasons, though, that I feel it is important to go beyond averages um, is because we do currently rely primarily on voluntary programs, and these are costly programs, and we have limited budgets. So if we're not being careful with how this money is being spent and where it is being, um, who it is being given to for which practices and which locations of the landscape, then we're going to continue to not move the needle. I mean, that is the problem that we're in right now and where I think we would stay. So I appreciate um, the comment a lot and I agree um, that it is very costly 
to, tar to try to measure at every field um, a, a number of different metrics. So, I, I, you know, I don't want to be naive and, and say that that's what I'm proposing. I'm not proposing every field, mm -hmm. um, but I do think that we need to be um, careful about thinking about local characteristics, the goals, just as um, Rochelle just mentioned, and maybe that will also help us with this targeting. I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if we had all the money in the world, then I think the, the averages would be fine, <laughs> but we don't. And I think to Rochelle's point, and this was in some Aaliyah slides, but we know that the lack of flexibility in a lot of federal programs is one of the big turnoffs for people. And so if we could create more of those localized opportunities. And, the, and those do exist, not the scale that the federal programs do. And so that's what's tricky about that. Um, I think we have maybe time for one more question. Um, and this was from Tom Burke. I'll just ask it unless Tom wants to jump in and ask it. Um, but he was wondering, um, given this is the Environmental Health Matters Initiative, um, he's a little puzzled by the absence of public health and the discussion of incentives and rewards. So is it time to shift the discussion from rewards for good practices to accountability for bad practices? So I don't know, Tom, if you want to add anything else to that, but I think it flows with what we've been talking about and comments made by speakers about, well, the problem might be driven by a minority. Several of our farmer panelists have said a lot of us are doing the right thing. So when do we drill down and start to say, here's where the problems are and let's really fix the problems where they need to be fixed? Yeah, thanks, Robin. And thanks to the, the to all of you for presenting today. What great panels. But uh, since our mission is the environment and health link, and, and, uh, and I know it's implicit in what all of you do, uh, particularly for uh, food safety and crop safety, and, uh, that health is, is, is on the radar screen. But I was wondering as, as, a, as an incentive uh, and as a, as a reward, as, as you, you think about balancing those things, whether um, the public health impacts of, of sustainability come into the equation or how, how can we in the, in the public health community be supportive of your efforts? because they, they do have profound effects on health. I, I'm not sure I totally understand your question, Tom. Are, are you asking uh, how we can partner to? Well, that'd, that'd be great, but, uh, but really the, the conference started off with uh, uh, really a great uh, discussion and, and a day devoted to uh, looking at the, the human health impacts of, of nitrogen. And, uh, and one, of, one of the things that um, you was know, probably apparent from the, the subsequent discussions is that um, although there's localized issues with contaminated groundwater and things like that, that the down, downstream effects, particularly the, the effects that uh, might be public health impacts, um, or, or don't seem to be in the equation when it when we look at balancing or, or balancing the benefits uh, versus costs, or or looking at incentives for sustainability. And and I'm I'm just wanting to get your take on that. Do you do you think about the downstream health effects, or um, is is there a way for us to uh, to be part of that discussion in the in the public health community, because obviously lots of, of local health officers and lots of communities have been impacted um, by nitrate contamination in, in, in their water supplies. Can I offer uh, some 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 answer here? Uh, very very wonderful concept. So here I get here in my home state of Delaware. Uh, we are we are we're, we're on the cusp uh, to create a uh, basically a water quality trust fund uh, that would be uh, seeded with uh, with part of our uh, uh, you know Delaware State uh, revenue stream uh, and uh, as I see it though, the challenge that we're going to have in that is that again there's going to be competing interests and competing stakeholders for what still is going to be limited resources. And no matter how much money you throw at something, 
there still is a limit to how much you can you have available to spend. And what I mean by that is that within uh, within this uh, uh, clean water trust fund board, there's the potential that those stakeholders that believe the solution is more uh, public water systems, public water supply systems. So they're going to want the mon- money uh, funding to install more uh, public uh, water uh, distribution systems, uh, so that more citizens will have uh, will have cleaner water. There's going to be the tourism aspect, and what they're going to want is they're going to be wanting to, to compete for those dollars to be able to uh, make the the bodies of water where the tourists come to play in uh, to be uh, fishable, swimmable, drinkable. Uh, and then in the agriculture sector, say our state roughly is around you know, 45 feet above sea level. Uh, we have drainage infrastructure, and maintenance of that drainage infrastructure is extremely important. And there's lots of things that we can do in that drainage infrastructure to keep the water quality good. You know, putting in uh, uh, basically nitrogen capturing basins, uh, putting in phosphorus traps. Uh, in those uh, in those uh, drainage systems, so you know we are going to be competing uh, for again those limited resources uh, in order to uh, not only maintain and improve our drainage infrastructure, but to be able to uh, be more in compliance with our uh, with our WIP, our watershed implementation plan uh, requirements that are imposed upon us. So yeah, there's therein lies the challenges. No matter no matter what you do, there's competing interests and competing stakeholders for limited resources. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid I have to give Richard the last word because we are out of time. So thank you everyone for the thoughtful discussion and engagement. And I'm going to hand it uh, back to Kathy to wrap things up. Thank you, everybody. That was uh, a, a remarkably uh, engaging discussion. So uh, so appreciative of the farmers and all the um, academics who joined today to share their ideas and help us think about um, what next steps might be. So with that, I'm going to sign off, but I'm going to remind you all that we do have one more session next week. Um, and we will be um, trying to wrap things up. We will hope very much that there will be lots of input from um, people. We'll be focusing um, on health impacts of nitrogen as well as solution pathways. And we're gonna draw heavily from the things we've heard about in the workshop, as well as we'll welcome uh, more ideas and brainstorming from the all of you who hopefully will come next week. So thank you very much. Stay uh, healthy. And if you're in a cold part of the country, stay warm. See you in a week.